Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Pugh. I am a staff scientist at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology's Visualization Core Laboratory. I am also a certified instructor with software and, and data carpentry. So if you're not familiar with software and data carpentry, it's a global nonprofit organization whose main objective is to teach foundational uh, scientific computing uh, and data science skills uh, primarily to students uh, and academics and research staff at, at universities around the world, but also to um, you know anyone doing research um, at you know government labs um, or um, private research institutes, uh, things like that. Okay, so today we are going to start in on what will be a series of courses, kind of every Tuesday afternoon for the next five weeks or so kind of to teach you the foundational skills that you need to do data science and machine learning um, with a focus on those interested in doing uh, data science and machine learning, either research or practice. So we're gonna focus a lot on uh, practical tools and methods that you need to get your work done, um, either whether if you're joining us from here at CalST and you're a student or research staff or faculty member, or you're joining us from outside of CalST, maybe you're at a different university or you're at um, a, a government institution or um, you know, private institution here in Saudi Arabia or, or elsewhere. So a bit of housekeeping. So I'm going to be sharing some links now um, in the chat. So the first link that I'm going to share is to the GitHub repository, which contains all of the teaching materials for not just today, but for the whole uh, series of courses. So if you click that link, then you will be taken to uh, this page here that you see on the right-hand side of, of my screen. So this is a um, repository on a um, hosting uh, service called GitHub. We'll be talking about how to use Git and GitHub for version control and for sharing uh, the software, the code uh, that you're going to write in a few weeks time. Um, we don't need to know anything about it today, but you just need to have a link and know that this is where all of the, uh, the course materials um, including the links to the computing environments, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, reside. Okay. So the next link that I want to share in the chat is the link to the teaching materials for the day. So if you click on that second link, you will be taken to you will be taken to this uh, page that I have on the left hand side of my screen. And uh, these are the teaching materials that have been developed by the software and data carpentry community to teach uh, today's topic, which is the, uh, the bash shell, sometimes also referred to as the unit shell. Um, and so we're going to be using these lecture notes today uh, during this workshop. So these lecture notes are always online and always available, as is the, the GitHub repository. It is also always online and always available. So these links will be at the, um, in the extra information section of the, just under the YouTube video uh, when this recording goes up on YouTube. So if you need to find these links, I'll make sure that they're posted there. Um, um, and then we'll of course share a link to the recording of the video um, once I post it, which will probably be uh, tomorrow sometime. Okay, so did anybody have any trouble opening either of those links? Hopefully not, but I'm going to take um, a quick look through the chat. So a couple of questions I'm seeing going through chat about um, um, problems installing software. So uh, for the purposes of these workshops, there's absolutely no software that you're going to need to install. Everything is going to run in computing environments that are um, going to run remotely on cloud providers. Now I'll mention a little bit more about that. Um, there are instructions included in the, the lesson materials as well as in the, uh, the GitHub repo that will explain how to install you know, all the necessary software. If you want to install everything locally on your own computer, or your laptop, your workstation, or, or wherever, and, um, 
and work uh, on your own machine. So, but we're not going to do that today. Um, teaching this class remotely is very difficult to troubleshoot any software installation problems that, that users might have, particularly with such a large group. So we're just not going to do that. And we're gonna access some, some free cloud computing resources uh, for everything. Okay, and I will just drop in the links again to everybody because some people might be joining late. And if they join late, they won't see the links. So here's the link to GitHub again. And then uh, here's the link to the teaching materials. Okay, right. So let's talk a little bit about the computing environments that we're going to use today. So um, here at KAUST, we are blessed to have um, some, I have some excellent colleagues in the IT research computing division who have, um, who are providing uh, the computing resources that will be used by anybody who's joining us from KAUST. So if you are from KAUST and you are um, here at KAUST on campus and, um, Act connected to the internet on the KAUST intranet, then you should be able to access the KAUST Binder Hub. And you can access the KAUST Binder Hub by just clicking on this little button in the readme file of the GitHub repo. So if I just kind of open this in a new tab, then um, what you're seeing here is a what's called uh, a tool called Binder Hub, which is spinning up some uh, computing resources on uh, computing infrastructure that is here inside of KAUST. Okay, now this link will only work if you're joining us from KAUST and um, are connected to the KAUST internet. Um, but then eventually you should get something that looks like this. Now, if you're joining us from outside of KAUST, then if you just click on this other button, which is the launch public Jupyter lab. So if I was to right click, and open that in a new tab, um, you will see the, uh, the same thing. This is just running on different infrastructure that's been provided by the Binder Hub Federation, um, which is a collection of um, organizations, some universities, some data science institutes and in, in different countries, some uh, uh, cloud computing providers like Google and Microsoft. They've donated free cloud computing resources on top of which um, the Binder Hub runs and then makes available um, computing environments for these kinds of, um, of workshops or for you to share your code um, in a way that it can actually be run by other people um, without having to install any software. So if you want, you can follow the links to the Binder Hub documentation and things if you want to learn more about that project. Um, but um, both the Binder Hub Federation and uh, here locally at KAUST, the IT Research Computing, without uh, these two groups, it would not be possible for me to provide uh, this kind of training to this many people um, remotely um, because the uh, the difficulties of everybody getting software installed and things like that and up and running, it would just be prohibitive um, without these kinds of, of tools. So, uh, but you don't need, um, you only need one instance running. So since I'm joining from KAUST, I'm going to close out the second tab. Now, a um, couple more things about these, uh, these Binder Hub instances. Um, so you can always come back and click these links. So if you uh, fall behind a little bit today and you want to go back and rewatch the video and rerun all the commands, all you have to do is go back to uh, the GitHub repository and click one of the buttons. That's it. So the compute instances will, um, will always be there so that you can come back and run this code uh, whenever you want. Um, the compute instances are ephemeral in the sense that after a certain amount of time, if they're not used, they will be shut down and cleaned up. Um, I think the timeout is a little bit different between whether you're on the KAUST uh, binder hub or the public binder hub, um, but it's on the order of you know, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so if you, um, if you let your, your compute instance go idle and you don't interact with it in any way, um, then you might find that it has shut itself down, in which case you'll just need to go back and click the button again. Um, you will lose any work that you've done up until that point. Um, so, you know, try to keep your session live 
um, if uh, if you want to you know keep everything kind of up to date. Okay. Right. Well, um, so let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, well, actually, what I should do is um, ask if there are any questions before I go ahead and jump in. So uh, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask a question or you can pop your question in the chat. Um, but did anybody have any, um, any trouble getting the computing environments up and running, um, at least one of them, um, either the CalST Jupyter Lab or the public uh, Jupyter Lab? Or any questions about I don't know, logistics or anything today. Yeah, I uh, actually do have a question. This is Yusuf Hamad. Um, uh, so uh, if I have the software installed, if I have Git Bash, as per the, I think there was a prerequisite or a page mm -hmm. discussing this course today, can I follow along using the, the, the terminal installed on my PC? So yes, you can. Um, but you will need to get um, you will need to get the the data files that we're going to use. So um, if you go down to the bottom of the the um, the course lecture notes, uh, I think it's down near the bottom, or maybe it's ah here it is setup. So there's a link for setup, and if you click that link, you'll see that there's this zip directory of data. So if you are trying to use the the bash shell that is already on your machine. Uh, then you will need the data that we're going to use for today's workshop in order to work locally on the machine. So you'll have to, um, so you'll have to uh, download and install that. But if you just use the, um, if you just use the installed binder hubs, then or the pre-installed compute environments that I've created, then in the uh, there's a directory here which we're going to look at in a minute called Introduction to Shell. And then that data file has already been downloaded and is already available for you. So there's nothing to do. So if you're working locally, then you'll have to go to the setup page and you'll have to download this, uh, this zip directory. You can just click on it, save it. Um, and then you'll have to open it and then navigate to that directory. Okay. Uh, yeah. excuse, excuse me, sir. Yes. I mean, um... Are there any connection with R software as well? Um, so R is not something that we're going to be talking about um, during this um, this series of courses. It's going to focus on basically a, Py a, a Python focused uh, software stack. Um, however, there is um, software carpentry does maintain a set of R. Um, our lecture notes, and I will just go ahead. Uh, oh, that's not what I wanted. Bar. Uh, uh, okay, so there are uh, two sets of lecture notes for R. If you're interested in in that, um, I'll just post actually the link to the whole lessons uh, in the chat. And I will also post this in the, the extra information on the YouTube um, uh, video as well. So people can have that link later. But you'll see here, if you're interested in learning R, so there are, um, there are two lessons, programming with R and R for reproducible scientific analysis. Um, so if you want to learn about R, then I would recommend going through those, those lectures. They're very good. They follow, cover a lot of the same kinds of material that we're gonna talk about for Python in a couple of weeks. Um, but the community here um, at CalST doing machine learning and data science is very Python, um, Python centric. And also what I found is that in private industry as well, a lot of uh, machine learning and data science is very Python uh, centric, so to speak. Okay, any other questions? Okay, cool. Uh, well, let's go ahead and get started then. Okay. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to talk about the Unix shell. So the Unix shell has been around for a long time. We're going on well over 50 years uh, at this point. It was one of the first kind of uh, ways of interacting with 
computers. Um, and we're, but it's very powerful and it has a high, um, it's very good at performing and automating a lot of complex um, tasks. And with a, just a few keystrokes or a few lines of code, you can automate a lot of, of potentially very repetitive tasks that might take you a long time. Um, but with that power comes a little bit of a learning curve. So we're gonna have to learn some new commands. We're gonna have to learn how to use a terminal most of us have grown up with um, uh, graphical user interfaces, so uh, where you point and click or drag and drop, or touch screens where you know you use your finger to kind of select and um, and move through and navigate and interact with, or even voice computing now, where you talk to the computing device and tell it what to do, and then it goes off and does things. So the shell is. Uh, very powerful, but more um, more basic in the sense that we're going to be typing commands um, at a terminal, and we're going to hit uh, we're going to hit enter and see what it does, and learn how to work in that fashion. Okay, there aren't any real prerequisites for this course. Um, as long as you you know have some experience with a computer, you know what a file is, you know what a directory or folder is, then you're ready to go. Um, there is a follow on lesson. Uh, to this uh, this shell lesson, which I don't cover as part of the introduction to data science workshop series, um, but it's called shell extras, and it's basically like if you know how to um, manipulate files and directories, navigate around the file system, write simple scripts, look for things in the file system using commands like grep and find. Um, if you already know how to do that, then um, that's what we're going to cover today. So you might be a bit too advanced for this course if you already know how to do most of those things, in which case you can check out the shell extras um, and that will cover uh, more advanced material um, that you might find um, more relevant. Okay, so here's kind of the, the schedule of events for today. So we're going, I'm going to quickly introduce the shell and what it is, and then we're gonna talk about how to navigate files and directories. So that's kind of a moving around the file system. Um, uh, we're going to talk about working with files and directories, which is going to be more mostly about creating, copying, moving, deleting files, editing files. Um, and then we're going to get, so that's like the really basic stuff. You know, that's stuff that you're used to doing with like double clicking and maybe dragging and dropping and this kind of thing. Then in, uh, in episode four, which is going to be on pipes and filters, and then five loops, and then six shell scripts. Four, five, and six are kind of the meat of, of today's workshop. These are the core techniques for automating um, data analysis and scientific workflows that many of our users um, will, uh, many of our users here at CALST are gonna be doing it day, on, on day in, day out basis. And they're gonna need to know how to do these things. And then if we have time, we'll wrap up with finding things, which is going to use commands like grep and find to look for stuff um, on a file system um, efficiently. But we'll see. Sometimes we get to that episode, sometimes we don't. If we don't get to it, then it's there. You can go through it on your own time. Okay. So questions. Any questions before we start out with the first episode? Okay, cool. So if you just go ahead and click on introducing the shell, that will take you to the first episode uh, lecture notes. And then if we go over here to our computing instance in JupyterLab, um, so you may have noticed earlier, so if you're not familiar, many, I'm sure most of you are not at all familiar with JupyterLab. I'm not gonna talk about it in detail today because we're gonna go into details um, in the Python episode in um, two weeks time. Um, but it has a lot of stuff. You can use Python notebooks and Python consoles and stuff like that. But today we're just going to use a terminal. So we're basically just using JupyterLab as an interface to get access to a terminal. So if you click on the little button that says terminal, then you will get access to a, a basic bash terminal. And then you can, and then, so this is what we're gonna do for the whole day. We're gonna be typing commands and hitting enter and seeing what those commands do. And we might do, and we'll do a little bit of shell scripting um, uh, later this afternoon. So the way it's gonna work is I'm going to, you know, talk a little bit, and then I'm gonna write some commands and hit enter and we'll see what they do and we'll talk about them. And the commands are, are typically buried in the, in the notes. So things like LS, which we'll get to in a minute um, and things like that. 
Uh, and so I'll just kind of go back and forth between uh, the lecture notes on the left and then typing the commands out uh, on the right. Okay, cool. So introducing the shell. So the big question that we want to talk about in this short episode uh, to get started is, you know, what is a command shell and why should I use one? And the key objectives are to explain kind of how the shell relates to the keyboard, the screen, the operating system, and user programs. And then we really to distinguish between a command line interface, which is what the shell is, and the graphical user interfaces, which we're all used to um, interacting with, with you know, point and click and drag and drop or touch screen, things like this. So, um, so let's go ahead and, and dive in. So we're all used to graphical user interfaces. Again, this is the point and click and drag and drop and menu driven instructions. So GUIs are very widely used because they're very intuitive and, and easy to learn. So anybody, you know, I have young kids, you know, they have had ac access to, I don't know, maybe phones or, or laptop or, or iPads or tablets, devices. And, you know, even a child as young as like two or three can pretty quickly figure out how to get stuff to, um, how to move around on one of these tablet devices because the drag and drop and you know touch screen interface is very intuitive to use. But despite the fact that it's very intuitive, it's very inefficient. If you have um, kind of repetitive tasks that need to be done over and over and over again, you know dragging and dropping a file or clicking a menu drop down and then selecting some options and then clicking some um radio buttons and then clicking you know enter or something like that is a very is a very tedious process and can take quite a long time and a better way to complete those kinds of tasks is to use something like a command line interface where you type the commands um, one by one or maybe multiple commands in a sequence and then run those same commands over and over again that's a much better way to automate these kinds of repetitive tasks. And that's what we're going to, that's what I'm going to teach you how to do today. Okay. Um, so the shell, so what is the shell? So the shell is, is a program. So the shell is a computer program where you type commands and then you evaluate those commands and then you get those uh, commands back. There are many different flavors uh, or variants of the shell. Um, the most popular one is called the bash shell. Um, and that's the one that I'm going to teach you today. So it's by far the most widely used uh, variant of the shell. And so that's the one that we're gonna focus on. But many of the other variants have by and large the same commands. They all have their little idiosyncrasies, um, but if you, learn how to use bash you will also be able to use these other variants of the shell if you want to um, you know expand out and try one okay there is a bit of a learning curve it's not going the the shell commands are not necessarily going to be as intuitive as maybe a gui will be but as we'll see they're much more powerful and and makes it a lot easier to automate repetitive tasks so the first thing that you need to know about the shell is the prompt so what is the prompt and the prompt is basically this bit here. So let me try to highlight it. So we highlight this whole thing. So this is the prompt. And the prompt you have, typically it can take different formats, um, but typically you're going to have a username. In this case, the username is Jovian, which is just a, uh, a fictitious user that's created inside of this cloud instance. And then you'll have the at sign, followed by the host, which is usually like the name of the computer where, where you're running. And in this case, we have this really long and complicated host, but that's because we're running inside of a uh, cloud computing instance that's running on some server someplace, either here at Calst or, or somewhere in the cloud, and it has a complicated name. You know, typically this might be, you know, your username at, you know, your iMac or your iPad or your, um, you know, your computer or something like that. And then you'll have uh, a colon 
and then we'll talk about this little tilde in a minute, and then a dollar sign. The dollar sign usually indicates the, the end of the prompt, and then you'll have this blinking bit, which is the cursor. And so that is where we're going to type commands like, like uh, ls and hit enter. Okay. And um, okay. So we don't type the prompt. So you're never going to see me type like a, a dollar sign or anything like that. The dollar sign is already there. It just shows up in the notes to kind of to as a stand in for the prompt. So we don't write out like an entire prompt. We just put the little dollar sign to indicate that there's a prompt. And then what comes after that is the command that you type. So um, if you haven't already done so, so go ahead and test out that first command, that ls command, uh, and hit enter. So this ls command is short for listing. And as you might guess, it lists the contents of the current directory. So if you were, for example, to compare, um, if you were to compare, what happened? I seem to have lost the connection to my compute instance. So I will go back and get a new one. Do that. I will get a new one. And I will get rid of that old one. So again, at any time, if you lose connection to your, your instance, you can just go back and click one of these buttons and, and get a new one. Okay. Now get a terminal. And then we'll run the ls command. And then we'll see we're listing the contents of the current directory. And actually, you can see here, because in JupyterLab, the, this file pane also lists the contents in, kind of in more of a GUI form. You can see that what you have listed here it's kind of the same as what you have listed here. It's just in two different, uh, two, two different formats. So I'm going to get rid of that um, to have a little bit more room to work. Okay. Um, so if you type a command, if you type the name of a command that doesn't exist, like in, if you make a typo instead of ls, you type ks, then you get this error. So this is the uh, command not found. It just means that there is no program that corresponds to the command that you have written. So it usually indicates that you've just made a typo someplace. Okay, so let's talk about the, the scientific problem that we're gonna use as motivation as we learn our bash commands today. So we have a fictitious marine biologist called Nell Nemo, and she's gone out on this six month survey of North Pacific Gyre, and she has sampled a bunch of marine life in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is this um, spot in the Northern uh, Pacific Ocean where a lot uh, where the currents bring all the garbage that ends up in the ocean, they kind of bring it all the way up there and it kind of joins together and forms this gigantic garbage patch. And um, it's quite large. I believe it's somewhere on the order of like the size of France. And it just kind of sits out there in the northern part of the Pacific Ocean. And all this plastic that comes out of the North American or Asian um, continent, or maybe even South America, and gets into the ocean currents, it all, it all ends up there. And so she's made all these samples. And so she's collected, say, 1,520 physical samples that she's going to need to take back to her lab and run through some machines to extract the relative abundance of 300 proteins. So this is a very similar project or um, kind of analysis pipeline that many researchers at the Red Sea Institute here at Calsk might have. So they will go out to the Red Sea with various instruments and collect data from coral reefs or water or, uh, or animal life. And they'll need to bring it back to Calsk to the core labs and run it through various analysis machines. And they will get out from these analysis machines, they'll get out data. And then they'll need to go and do stuff with that data. And depending on the number of samples that they have, you know, this is a very repetitive task. You know, in the case of this pipeline, this Nels pipeline, she has over 1,500 samples. They're going to measure the relative abundance of 300 proteins. She needs to run each of these 1,520 files through some kind of analysis stats program. And then she has to write up a report and submit it off to try to get it published in a journal. 
And this can take a lot of time. So if she needed to run using a GUI and like kind of drag and drop each of these 1500 files into a uh, into the, the GUI stats program so it would run this analysis and get the analysis back, you know, that might take um, you know, 30 seconds for each file. And so 30 seconds times 1500 files is like 12 hours of, of her physical attention where she has to manually sit there, drag and drop, hit enter, wait for the results, save the results someplace, get the second file, drag and drop, wait for the results, get the results back. So this is quite tedious and it takes up 12 hours of her time. She has to sit there and do this. So what we're going to learn today is how to automate tasks like this so that you write a sequence of commands in bash, wrap it up in a script, hit enter and walk away. And the computer goes off and does all of this for you. And then you can come back um, and, um, and move on once the computer's done all the hard work for you. So that's kind of the goal of, of today. And to do these kinds of things, you have to know how to navigate files and directories, create files, chain commands together with pipes, filter the output with filters, and iterate over different files uh, in constructs like for loops. So these are the things that we're going to talk about today. OK, and so to just to quickly wrap up this, uh, this uh, initial episode, so just a reminder, so the shell is a program. And the primary purpose of, of the shell is to take other programs like ls, execute them, and return the results. That's running a program. So we're going to focus on Bash, which is the default implementation in most uh, for most uh, Unix-based systems. Um, main advantage of the shell is it has a high kind of action to keystroke ratio. So with very little, um, a small number of commands or keystrokes, we're going to be able to do quite powerful and, and sophisticated things. Um, a disadvantage is again, it's not as intuitive as GUIs. You know, everything is very textual. Um, some of the commands might appear a bit cryptic, like ls, you know, ls means to you know, list the contents of a directory, and that's probably one of the less cryptic commands that we might, we might cover today. Some of them are, are less intuitive even than that. Okay, so just a quick look at the, um, at the chat. Looks like everybody is, um, is good to go. So let's go ahead and move right along. Okay, so uh, episode two, navigating files and directories. So in this episode, we're going to talk about how to move around on your computer. You know, when all you have is the terminal, how do I move to change between different directories? And how do I see what is in files and directories? And how do I think about where files and directories are located on my computer? So uh, we're going to talk about the differences and similarities between files and directories. We're going to talk about the difference between an absolute path and a relative path, and being able to go back and forward between absolute paths and relative paths is a key learning outcome for this episode. We're going to get some practice at doing exercises where we're going to construct these absolute paths and relative paths. And we're going to talk about um, options and arguments to different programs. And we're going to see how you can use different options and arguments to change the behavior of a program. OK. So here we go. So on your computer is an operating system. It might be Windows or Mac OS or some flavor of Linux like Ubuntu. And the operating system controls your computer. And part of that operating system is a file system. And the file system is responsible for managing files and directories and organizing them in a way that you can you know, navigate them and, and storing your data in an efficient manner. So that's what the file system does. You now, most file systems organize data in a hierarchy where you have um, a hierarchy of folders. And then inside folders, you either have um, files or more folders. And then eventually, if you go all the way down the file system hierarchy, you'll eventually end up in a directory that has is either empty or has only files. OK, so the first command that we need to learn is a command that tells us um, basically what directory are we currently in. So that command is called PWD for print working directory. So if you type PWD and you hit Enter, 
you, you will get the absolute path from the root of your file system to the current directory where the terminal is, uh, is open. In which case it's our home directory for the Jovian user. Okay. Okay. So home directories will look different depending on your system's operator, the operating system on your computer. So for example, if you're on Win, if you're using Windows, then your um, your home directory might look something like this. It might be C colon slash documents and settings slash Nell or uh, C colon slash user slash Nell. If you're on um, Mac or here we're on uh, in the cloud, we're on Linux. So it will look like slash home slash your, your username or on Mac, it will be slash users slash your username, something like this, but basically the same. Okay. Um, right. So here's a, a basic schematic for what a file system might look like. So at the, at the root of the file system, there is a, a leading slash. So we can see the leading slash is here. And so that's the root of the file system. And then inside that, we have a bunch of directories. And inside those directories, we might have more directories. And eventually, we'll have some files. And eventually, we'll, we would reach down to directories that have only files for the most part. OK. So when we see paths that start with a slash, that indicates that this path is an absolute path because it starts at the root of the file system and goes all the way down to the current directory or to the file in the file system. So that the absolute path uniquely defines the location of a file or directory in the file system. Okay. okay. Um, so here's another example. So here we have the root of the file system and inside the root directory of the file system, we have a user's directory. And inside that user's directory, we might have multiple users who have used this computer. So, you know, on your own laptop, you might only have like one or maybe two users. On a shared system like we have here on Ibex or Shaheen, there might be thousands of users uh, in this user directory. Okay. So let's go back and, and talk a little bit about the ls command. So the ls command, again, lists the contents of your current directory. Um, and you know, the results would look differently. You know, if you ran the LS, this ls command on your home directory on Windows, obviously, you get different set of results than what we have here. If you're on Mac, you get something that looks like this. You know, if, if I run ls on my user, user home directory on my Mac, then I'll get something that looks like what we have here in the lecture notes. Um, so we can change the behavior of this ls command by adding options, uh, sometimes also referred to as switches or flags, uh, and these change the behavior. So let's look at the first option. So ls space followed by dash and uh, f. So this changes the output. So what, it, what this does is it puts um, a trailing slash on anything that is a directory and then leaves files the same. Yeah. So here we can see that we have all these directories like Docker and introduction to Conda, introduction to Python, um, introduction to SQL. And then we have files like license, readme, requirements.txt, environment.yaml, apt.txt. So in our particular implementation of the shell, we also have some nice color coding. So we can see that this kind of bluish gray also indicates visually that something is a directory, whereas files are just standard black text. Not every uh, bash implementation will have kind of color coding for um, uh, color coding to differentiate between things. So that's why this dash F option is, is kind of useful. OK. So if you want to clear your terminal, so sometimes you know, we, we're going to type a bunch of commands and the terminal is going to get filled up with output. At any time, we can just type the clear command and hit enter, and that will clear out um, your terminal. Uh, it doesn't 
really delete anything because then you can use the up arrows to toggle through commands that you've previously run. And so you can toggle back and run your ls-f command again, or toggle back and run the pwd command by pressing the up arrow to go back or the down arrow to go forward. Okay. Um, so let's talk about getting help. So if you're on a local machine, so you should be able to get help um, by doing one of two things. So you can try the ls help. So ls space dash dash help um, gives you a uh, the help menu, which is like the documentation for, um, for the command. Sometimes, um, so now I'm going to type the clear command to clear this out. There's another program called man, which is short for manual. And sometimes you can do man space and then the name of the command and then get the manual, which will give you the same information as using the ls dash dash help. Um, but on the cloud instances on which I have installed all the software, the manual uh, program has not been installed. And so it won't work here, but it probably will work on, uh, on Mac or uh, your Linux local machine. Uh, it will not work on Windows, but the dash dash help um, generally works everywhere. Um, so I tend to use that. Um, so let's look at the help menu again. Um, so the help menu, you know, it shows all these options. And you can see even for a command as simple as ls for like listing files, the listing information about files has a lot of options. And many times there is a, a short option, which is a single dash followed by a letter, lower or uppercase letter, and a long option. The long option is like the one that I used here. So dash dash help is an example of a long, a long option. Um, but I'm pretty sure that dash lowercase h will give you the same thing. Let me just try to find it. Um, oh, maybe it won't. So it looks like only dash dash help will get you the help menu. Um, we'll see some examples of, of short versus long options uh, again in a minute. Okay, so now I'm gonna clear this out again. Okay. Um, so unsupported command line options. So if you were to try to do ls followed by a single dash and a lowercase j, you would get an error message that says, oh, this is an invalid option. Um, and then if we looked at the help menu again, we could see that whilst there are quite a lot of options, um, there is no dash lowercase j option in here. So that's just an example of the type of error that you will get if you type an invalid option. Okay. Um, let's skip the manual pages. Okay, so now we've come to the first of our two exercises. So what I would like you to do is, um, play around with the ls command and try to um, you know, explore what some of these flags do and then see if you can figure out by looking at the help menu, how to solve this listing in reverse chronological order exercise. And if you want to check your answers, you can just click this down arrow and it will give you the solution, the commands and the flags and the explanation of why they work. But if you just want to take, um, say, three minutes and have a go at, at, uh, at looking at these exercises, then I will um, take that kind of downtime to, I'll take a look at the chat um, and see if there are any questions there or people can unmute themselves and ask questions. So I'll set a little timer for three minutes and see if you can explore these flags with LS and, um, and solve those two exercises. Uh, excuse me. Um, yes. Uh, what about the FTP? I mean, like file uh, transfer protocol. I mean, it can, can be switched from machine to other on those commands. Uh, it, it works under this kind of shell. So, so okay. So, um, yes. So you absolutely can use the shell to connect to um, and send data to other computers. 
In fact, that's one of the primary reasons for learning to use the shell is so that you can work remotely with, um, with computers, whether it's if you're a Calst user, the only way to access IBEX, uh, our IBEX and Shaheen computing uh, clusters is to use the shell to log in and transfer data um, to, to those computers and then interact with them entirely using the shell. If you're using uh, cloud computing resources, like so there's Google Cloud Shell, uh, Microsoft Azure has their own kind of implementation of Cloud Shell, um, and um, other cloud providers, AWS, the same. Um, so this is, although we're, we're not going to talk about um, sending data or logging into remote computers today, that's something that's covered in the more advanced uh, Shell Extras uh, materials that I mentioned earlier, and the link to which will be uh, provided below the, uh, the video on YouTube. Um, but the shell is one of the um, primary uh, thing, methods for doing that. Um, and I seem to have lost my terminal again. Okay, so I'm actually going to, that's the second time that my Calc Binder Hub has died on me. So I'm actually going to go and hop on the public Jupyter Lab. and use that. OK. Um, another uh, just a bit of context on the shell. So the way that I use shell, so the shell is one of the tools that I use every day in my work. Um, I don't typically use the shell so much for doing actual data analysis. I usually do data analysis in Python um, or, um, well, mostly Python, um, but you could also use R or some other language focused specifically um, for uh, data analysis. Um, what I use the shell for is kind of taking different pieces of my data analysis and kind of gluing them together and automating collections of analysis scripts into pipelines or workflows. Okay, so I'm seeing some notes in the chat that people have also lost their, uh, um, their binder connectivity. Um, so again, if, you if, you've, if you've been using the Calc Binder Hub and you've, it's, it's uh, dropped you, um, which it has twice for me already, um, then just go and click on the public Jupyter Lab and try using those uh, those resources, and we'll see if that uh, that turns out to be a bit more uh, a bit more stable. Okay, so let me get my terminal back, and okay, cool, and we'll do pwd and then ls dash f. Okay, cool. All right, so let's take a look at these, uh, these two exercises. So um, the first one wants you to explore options. Um, so ls, ls l, and what does this do? So it seems to give you quite a bit more information about, um, about the file. So not only do we have the files over here on the right-hand side, but we have some kind of a date timestamp for maybe when that file was last modified. Um, some numbers here, it's not clear what these numbers are. And then we have uh, what looks like our username twice, and then some other cryptic stuff over here that it's not clear what this is. So um, we get different output, but we're not really sure what that output is. So the best thing to do at this point is to check out the help menu. So if we go to the help menu and we scroll through here and we look for dash lowercase l. So here that here's that dash lowercase l. So use a long listing format. So that also doesn't give us a whole lot of information uh, to go on, um, but it tells us that we're going to get a, a different kind of format for the files. So the next option was this dash h option. So let's, since we have it open, let's look at this. 
So dash H is short for human readable. So it says that we should use this in conjunction with the dash L and or the dash S, and it does, it prints human readable file sizes. So, hmm. all right, so let's go back and see what that does. Um, so if I, I'm gonna clear this out again, and now if I type LS and you can combine options. So instead of typing dash L or dash H and which is fine, you can do this. You can actually just combine them into uh, one option like this. And so now let's compare that to um, the output that we get with just dash L. So here in this uh, one, two, three, four, in the fifth column, if you do dash LH, you get um, units on these file sizes. So here, instead of 4096, which you're like, what is 4096? You see that actually that was four kilobytes. Or instead of a very big number, it might, you would see, you know, four uh, G, four, four gigabytes or something like that. So it makes it easier to tell kind of how big file sizes are. All right, so let's take a look at the, the second exercise, which is listing in reverse chronological order. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear that out. So um, the command, they say the command that ls-t lists items by the time of the last change uh, instead of alphabetically. So uh, let's combine this with dash L. Okay. So this is a bit strange because actually all of these files were created on the same with the same timestamp. So actually changing this order isn't going to do very much for us. Um, so this will be maybe less uh, instructive than it would be on a typical file system where you would have lots of different uh, timestamps. Um, but if we wanted to reverse uh, the ordering, we could also add a R and that will completely reverse the, the ordering. Okay. All right, so let's move right along. So exploring other directories. So here we've been using, um, just gonna clear this again. So here we've been using LS to just kind of list the contents of, of the current directory, but we can actually use it to explore other directories. So for example, if we wanted to list the contents of the introduction to shell directory, we can just type ls and then the name of the directory that we want to list. And technically, this is the, the path to the directory that we want to list. And then that will list the contents of that directory instead of the contents of the current directory. We can also combine um, um, a uh, argument with some options. So we could do ls, ls dash f, and then we can provide the name of the directory. And then we can see that these same options that we've seen above, we're now applying them to the contents of the directory that we want to list. Okay. Um, and if we go one level further, so I can press up to get back to the, the command. And then I can actually list, um, now I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Um, so if I pass in the, um, not just the introduction to shell directory, but to the, the path to the data directory that's inside of it, then I will get the contents of that directory. And we could mix this with uh, the lowercase l option, and we could get the long form um, of the, uh, the output, which has more information. And again, we could combine that with the, uh, the lowercase h for human readable and get the human readable file sizes, things like that. Okay. 
So we've talked a lot about listing, but what if we want to change directories? We want to move through the file system. So we do that with the CD command, which is short for change working directory. So for example, um, instead of listing these contents, I could do change directory. And then I, I put in the path to the directory that I want to change into. So in this case, the introduction to shell data directory. And now if I run ls-f, uh, I'll do lhf again without any, any argument, uh, I get the same answer that I got up here. So here I, in the second approach, I use the, the cd command to change into a particular directory. And then I run ls with some options on that directory. And then I get the contents of that directory. Whereas in this option or this format, I passed some options to the ls command. And then I passed the path to the directory whose contents I wanted to list. Kind of thing. And you can see here that I left off the trailing slash. And here I added the trailing slash. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, either will, will work fine. OK. Now, after I have changed directories, if I type pwd to get the path to the current directory, I'll see that it's different. So the last time I ran the pwd command, I was, I was just in my home directory. But now I've changed directories. So I've changed the working directory. And now my new working directory is um, uh, is introduction to shell slash data. Okay. Now, so what if I wanted to go back to my home directory? So I'm in this slash home slash Jovian slash introduction to shell data. So what if I tried to do the following? I said, well, let's change to um, the, uh, suppose I wanted to change into the um, home uh, Jovian directory. Let me, uh, let me make this a little bit more. Uh, sorry, now I'm going to. So suppose that I wanted to try to change into, so I see where I currently am. If I try to change into the home uh, Jovian directory, it gives me an error. It says, well, I, where is this home slash Jovian directory? It I don't, doesn't exist. Um, or if I wanted to change into, um, so it doesn't exist. And that's because when you, um, when you pass an argument to the change directory command, it kind of expects that you're trying to move down the file system. So it expects that you are going to change into a directory that exists within the file system or within the current directory. So if I tried to change into any of these directories here, creatures, data, molecules, North Pacific gyre, writing, that'd be fine. It would happily do that for me. Um, so for example, I could do change directories into the writing directory, and that works fine. And you can see that um, the prompt has changed. So now we have the current directory is actually part of the prompt. Um, but if you type pwd, you can see that you've actually changed directories. But this is all moving kind of down this file system hierarchy. So what happens if I need to go up? So I want to go up to the what's called the parent directory of the current directory. So to do that, you use a special command, a chain, well, the command is change directory, but then the argument is a special argument. It's two, uh, two periods, so dot or two dots, dot, dot. And when you do that, it moves up to the parent of the current directory. And so now you can see that instead of the introduction to shell slash data slash writing, I'm now in introduction to shell slash data. If I type PWD, you can see the absolute path to my current directory. Now, 
I could do it again, go up one more level in the, the file system by typing cd dot dot. And I could keep doing this and walk, go all the way back up to my home directory. Okay. So how, how does this work? So why can you use this special dot dot and why does it work like that? Well, if there's a option, if we look at the help menu for list, or ls, there is a option dash a or dash dash all. And that um, shows you all of the files in the directory, including potentially hidden files, um, which typically start with dot hidden files or directories. Okay, so let's uh, clear this. And if we type ls dash f and then a dash a, we will see that in addition to, and let's compare that with what we got earlier when we just did dash f. So dash f shows us the contents of the directory and it, it uh, appends the slash on the end to indicate which are directories. But if we put the dash a option, we get extra stuff. So there are actually other directories. There's a dot Jupyter directory, dot local, and dot virtual documents, and dot empty, dot conda, and all this other stuff. And there are two directories, a dot, which refers to the current directory, and a dot dot, which refers to the parent. So when you type the command uh, cd dot dot, you are actually changing into this directory here, which itself points to the parent of your current directory. So that's how the, the CD dot dot mechanism works. Okay. Um, so there are lots of hidden files, uh, particularly in your home directory. Uh, you'll often have lots of these hidden files. Um, and they're typically going to be prepended by a dot, um, and thus they'll be ignored on Unix file systems by most commands. Um, and to see them, you have to do the ls a option. OK. Now, um, so let's, let's suppose that we were back in our um, intro production to shell data directory. And now what happens if we run uh, CD with no options or, or arguments? We just hit CD and hit enter. So where has that taken us? Well, it's actually taken us to our home directory. So that's like a handy shortcut that if, if you get lost in your file system someplace and you want to go home because you know your home directory is, then you just type CD and hit enter, and that takes you to your home directory, no matter where you are in the file system. Okay. Um, right. Um, when navigating around, so let's let's talk about absolute and relative paths. So now that we've talked about um, dot dot. Uh, we can, can we can differentiate between absolute and relative paths. Um, so for a moment, let's go to um, let's go back to introduction to shell data directory. Okay, and then we'll do an ls hf. Okay. Now, um, when we are changing directories, we can either pass a relative path or an absolute path. Now, an absolute path requires that you, you pass a path that starts with a slash and then walks all the, way down the, um, all the way down the file system from the root to the directory that you want to change into. So in this case, it would be um, slash uh, So how would this go? So let's actually look at what's in the root directory. So if we look at, um, if we were to 
change to slash home slash Jovian. And then we could do introduction new shell data and then writing. So here we are passing um, an absolute path, which starts with a slash and then goes all the way down the file system to a particular directory we want to change to. Now, that is um, quite a lot. Like we had to write um, this whole path out from the start of the file system all the way down the hierarchy. A shortcut is to use relative paths, which are a way of describing the path to the directory you want to change into relative to your current location. So in this case, so now let's go back to the introduction to shell slash data directory, which means we need to go up one level. Instead of providing the absolute path, we could just provide the relative path. And the relative path is actually just um, writing in this case. Or if you wanted to be slightly more formal, it would be dot to refer to the current working directory slash writing. But you, you don't have to put the dot slash. Um, so that's the difference between absolute and uh, relative paths. And we'll get some practice on that with exercises in a minute. Um, there is one other shortcut that I want to mention. So another, um, another shortcut is to use the tilde. So if I do cd uh, tilde, so this is another way of changing to the home directory. Um, and it's also a way to specify um, paths from the home directory. So if you if tilde stands in for the slash home slash jovian on this machine, then if you did change directory to tilde slash uh, introduction to Python, say, then that will work as well. And if we do PWD, so the tilde in this command basically was a shorthand notation for all of this. And so then we only had to type introduction to Python. So these are just different shortcuts from moving around the file system. Um, okay. So yeah. now let's take uh, let's take a bit of time to look at the uh, these exercises. So there are three exercises here. Um, on mostly on absolute versus relative paths. So I want you to take uh, a few minutes um, and have a go at them. And then I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, uh, the answers together and then we'll move on with the rest of the, uh, of the episode. Excuse me, David. Yes. Uh, so I'm running on my own uh, PC. So okay. Windows machine, and as far as I understand, in Windows, all file files are under C or D or some kind of letter, drive letter. Mm -hmm. Now, if I try out just like you did, ls, um, ls, and forward slash, I do get some files. Where do those files exist? Oh, on a Windows machine, that's a good question. So I don't have a lot of um, experience using Windows machines. Um, the I kind of I, I skipped over the difference between Unix and non-Unix based operating systems. So Mac and Linux are Unix based, so they operate on the same uh, file system principles. Um, Windows is not a Unix based system. Windows developed their own file system uh, organization principles, and they're slightly different than um, than Unix. And, and one in particular, like they use different slashes. So you may have noticed, like uh, I don't know, up here, I think we had some examples of. Uh, I understand that we use backslashes in Windows. Yeah, uh, that's how yeah. it works usually. Uh, um, so, but then your question was, where are the files when you, you type like a CD and then a, just a single slash? 
And the short answer is I'm not entirely sure. So I would, I would intuitively hope that on a Windows machine that this would somehow give you something similar to like the root of the file system because it, you know Windows has it has a it has a hierarchical file system. It's just organized around these different drives. But then above the drives, there has to be something that organizes how the different drives relate to like system files and stuff like that. So I would hope it's kind of something like that. But to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, OK, so have a look at these absolute versus relative paths. Um, relative path resolution and then some reading comprehension on LS. And we'll go through, we're not going to go on through all of these, but I'll talk about the answers to a couple of them. And let's see if there's any other uh, questions. So is there a limit to how many commands we can use with one dash? Um, I don't think so. Um, it's the, one of the things about the shell, so the shell was created at a time when um, you really needed to minimize the amount of keystrokes that you use to interact with a computer because it was really tedious. Even typing on, on very early computers was, was a bit tedious. Um, so you really wanted to minimize keystrokes. So they have a lot of shorthand notations. And so, you know, you can save a few spaces here and there by having a single dash followed by a bunch of different options. Um, what I often do in my own code is to try to make things more readable, I will use, um, I will prefer um, long form options rather than short options. So if I was using a, a bash command in a script that was going to be used by other people, I would, I might assume that maybe the other people who are gonna run the script don't know anything about this command. They've never used it before. So if I'm gonna specify a bunch of different options, I'll probably use the long form of the options, which is sometimes more indicative of what thing is actually doing rather than a single slash, a single dash followed by a whole bunch of letters, um, which is, is a bit cryptic. Um, so for example, uh, let's look at the, um, let's look at the example. So if I clear this out, and if we do ls dash lh um, rt. So that lists in long format with human readable uh, file sizes in reverse chronological order. Uh, so the other way of doing that, if we look at the, the help menu, um, would be to try to use some of the long form names. So we did a uh, which ones do we do? L, H, and T. So dash lowercase h has a human readable long form. The lowercase l doesn't have a, a, a long form. R does, and, and T does not. So another way that you could write this would be ls and then uh, dash l dash dash human readable uh, dash dash reverse. Uh, dash T. So that gives you the same kind of, of that gives you the exact same output. Um, and then it's kind of up to you to decide whether the, um, the long forms are better than the short forms. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of context dependent, I would say. But I, I, I do tend to use long forms in scripts that I'm writing that I expect people besides myself will use just to try to make it more readable. Okay. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of these, um, these exercises. Okay, so relative path resolution. So if PWD displays slash user slash thing, that means that we've gone from the root of the file system into users and into things. So we're in this directory. What will ls dash f and then dot dot slash backup display? So the dot dot means that you're going to the parent directory 
So you're going up to the parent directory of thing, down into backup. So this is an example of a relative path because the path dot dot slash backup is the path from the thing directory to the backup directory, but relative to the current directory thing. So to go from thing to backup, we have to go dot dot to the parent and then down into backup. So it should display original um, and then PNAS final and PNAS sub followed by a trailing slash because of the dash app option. So that would be number four. And uh, okay, well, let's just do that one in the interest of in the interest of time. Okay, so let's talk about the general syntax of a shell command. So the general syntax is going to be the name of a command or a program, and command and program are, are roughly the same thing, followed by a space, followed by some options. Um, and the options themselves could be, you know, all strung together, or they could be separated by spaces. They could be a mix of short form and long form options, followed by a space, followed by an argument. And in this case, we'll put um, as our example argument a slash. And so this command is going to list these two options, the root of the file system. So. There we go. Okay. All right. So let's look at file organization. So first we want to change into um, a, uh, a directory, North Pacific Gyre. So if we're in our home directory, we need to go into the introduction to shell directory and then into the data directory. And then if we list the contents there, we'll see that there is this uh, North Pacific Gyre directory. And we can list the contents of that North Pacific Gyre directory. Um, Ah, and so here's a good example of a typo error. So I tried to list the contents of North Pacific Gyre, but I misspelled Pacific. So the way that you can avoid these types of typos is using actually something called tab completion. So if I type LS and then I just start typing letters, so N O R, and then I hit tab, it will complete out, it will do like a pattern matching on the contents of the directory and it will just complete out anything that matches that pattern. And so then I can you know, avoid having to type out all that stuff um, and also avoid typos. OK, so in this directory, we have another directory. So 2012.07.03. And if we list the contents of that directory, We can see that, okay, so now there are a bunch of files in this directory. Okay, so that was basically just to in introduce tab completion and this idea that, you know, if you're working on your own research project, try to, you know, organize your files in a sensible way, um, you know, use, um, use good file naming conventions, don't have white space in your file names. And if you are using directories or files that have uh, dates in them, like 2012, um, July 3rd, 2012, use uh, leading zeros. So prefer this kind of a format. So 2012-07-03, if you leave off the leading zeros, then when you use like bash commands to order, like to sort things, the sorting will not be, um, not correspond to the intuitive temporal sorting. Um, so use, um, you know, leading zeros and things like that when you're doing timestamps. Okay. And so some key points, um, before moving on, I think we'll take a short break after this episode, maybe like a five minute break, um, uh, for a toilet or tea or coffee or something. Um, so the file system is what manages information on your, on your disk. 
Um, information is stored in files and files are stored in directories or folders. Uh, directories also contain other directories and that's what creates this kind of tree like uh, hierarchy, hierarchical structure in most uh, computing file systems. You use uh, CD to change working directories, um, LS, which lists um, specific files or directories inside the current directory, um, uh, PWD, which prints the current working directory, the leading slash um, corresponds to the root of the whole file system. Most commands are going to take options, and the options are specified with a single dash and a letter, or maybe two dashes for a long form option. Then there's relative paths, which is the path from the starting location to, um, to the ending location, or there's absolute paths, which specifies the location from the root of the file system to the particular location. Um, Linux and Mac use um, I think forward slashes and Windows uses backslashes. And then finally, dot dot means the directory above the current one or the parent directory. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, briefly. So are there any questions? Um, and if not, we'll, we'll just go ahead and um, take a break. Uh, yeah, actually, I do have a question. Okay. Yes. So uh, if I have a uh, file with uh, some white space in a directory or file, how uh -huh. do I actually pass that in such that it can na navigate to that file? D is there something special that I need to do? To, 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 so you move, when you use the change directory commands, you're always moving from one directory to another. So if you try to put in the name of a, of a particular file, it will give you an error. So you always put in the directory that you want to that the directory that contains the file that you want to maybe use or something like that. Then you can move into that directory beforehand. Uh, what I mean is, if I'm trying to navigate into a directory with a white space in the oh name. oh yes, so um, you need to put double quotes around it, um, so that if you put double quotes around it, the the path, then um, Bash will interpret everything that's inside the quotes and it will kind of handle the white space properly. Um, you also, if you use tab completion, um, it will replace the spaces with an escape character that also handles the spaces properly. In general, it's really ideal to avoid white space in, um, in file names um, because it makes it really awkward to deal with when you want to automate things with, with scripting language like Bash. And the primary reason is that, as you've noticed, we use white space to distinguish between the name of a program and the options and the arguments. So if you don't do extra steps to handle the white space, then Bash or shell scripts will interpret spaces and file um, names as kind of a gap between arguments or a gap between options and arguments, and it will usually fail, do something really goofy. We'll see some examples of that later today. But rule number one of, of naming things, avoid white space. You can use uh, dashes or underscores in place of file, in place of spaces, if possible. Sometimes on Windows, it can't be avoided because Windows uses like documents and settings, um, and which has spaces in it. Um, and that's in most Windows systems. So, um, and I see there's a couple other questions in chat. So, are the square, how are the square brackets used syntactically? So, I think by square brackets, let me uh, share my screen again. So, by square brackets, you mean like this. So, it has CD and then square brackets pack, and that just means that it's an optional argument. So, we can run CD and not have any argument at all, and that takes us to our home directory. Or we can have CD with a path to some directory that we want to change into. And that could be a relative path, like uh, introduction to shell data, um, or it could have been an absolute path. Uh, and then if you look at um, ls uh, dash, let's look at the help menu for ls. You can see at the top of the help menu where they give you examples, you have ls 
followed by square brackets option, which indicates that you can pass zero or one or more options, followed by a file where you can actually list information about files, or if you don't provide any argument, you'll get the directory by default. So it, it indicates that it's optional. If you see, uh, if you if you look at a command and it doesn't have the square brackets, that usually indicates that there are certain required flags or options that you must use or um, arguments that you must pass. Otherwise, you'll get an error. Uh, that's a good question. Okay, awesome. So let us take a. Um, Let's go for a seven minute break and um, just to start back at 2.40. Um, and um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and pause the, the recording and then we'll pick up again in seven minutes time. So go have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, and maybe come back. I'm gonna get some water because um, my throat is a bit parched and I will see you guys in a few minutes, okay? All right, now. Okay, welcome back from the break, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen. And we'll pick up where we left off. So I'm going to clear this out. And OK, so we're going to move on from the second episode to episode three. So working with files and directories. And I'm going to change directories so that I am back in my home directory. Okay, so in this episode, we are going to talk about how to create, copy, and delete files and directories, and then how to edit files. So that's kind of the, the next big thing on the list of topics to cover. So we're going to see how to create a directory hi hierarchy that matches a diagram. So this is basically just going to be a, a, some practice exercises. Um, and then we're going to talk about how to create files um, in that hierarchy using an editor or by copying and renaming existing files. And then we're going to delete, copy, and move specified files and directories. So moving around the file system, that was in the previous episode. So this episode is now working with files and directories. And then once we have these two big pieces, we can go off and do uh, more interesting uh, and advanced things. OK, so how do we create a directory? So first, we want to be in our um, introduction to shell data directory. So just going to make this a little bit bigger. And then I'll just have to kind of move back and forth. So we want to be in our um, introduction to shell data directory. <laughs> and that was the, the um, directory that I was actually just in. But we'll just go back there. So we'll use tab completion to introduction to shell data. And now we can list the contents of that. OK. OK, so we're going to create a directory. So the command to create a directory is make dir, short for make directory. And then we type the name of the directory that we would like to create. So in this case, it will be make directory thesis. And that, that will create a directory called thesis. And you can see here's the directory that we created right there, thesis. Okay. Um, but there's nothing in that directory. So if we were to list the contents of the directory, we'd see that there's nothing there. Although if we use the dash uh, A option, we would see that there are these, actually there's these two special directories, the dot and the dot dot. And those are always in, in every directory, including empty directories. OK. Um, so with make uh, dir, you can create multiple directories at the same time. So for example, if we wanted to create uh, with an option uh, dash p. So let me walk this back. So let's suppose that we wanted to create um, a sequence of directories, so a directory called project. And in that directory, we would have, um, uh, we would create two directories, maybe uh, projects. And then inside that project, we'd have data and then a, a directory inside project results. So we could do that um, 
we could do two commands or we could combine it into one command by doing, if we pass the dash P option, sorry, let me walk this back. I'm, I feel like I'm not explaining this very clearly. So if we run LS, we can see that there's no directory called project. Um, so we could create, we could use the make dir command to create a directory called projects. And then we could use another make dir command to create a directory inside um, project called data. And we could use a third command to create a directory in another directory inside projects called results. Or we could do it all in one command by doing make dir. And then we put in the path to the directories that we want to create. So project data and project results. And, and you can see here, I've separated these two directories by space for these two paths by space. And because the project directory does not itself exist, I need to use the dash P option. And so now if I list the contents, we'll see here's this project directory. And then if I listed the contents of the project directory, we'd have data and results. So this is an example of, instead of doing multiple commands, we can actually get by with a single command to accomplish the same task. Okay. Um, so this call out box here, so two ways of doing the same thing. Um, so if we were to look at um, you know, our kind of GUI interface for looking at our, our files and folders, if we went to, oops, um, introduction to shell, data, and then you can see here, here are these directories that we created. So thesis was created a few minutes ago and project was created about a minute ago. So you'll see that these things, these directories are here. So these commands are like kind of, they're just two different ways of doing the same thing. So the, I'm teaching you commands that you could also accomplish tasks using like right click new directory and then type in the name of the directory and hit enter. Um, you know, the ways that you're used to creating files and directories in a GUI, you're fundamentally doing the same thing here. It's just by learning the commands to do them um, you can automate these tasks as part of a script, whereas you can't really automate drag and drop and point and click, that kind of thing. Okay. So now I'm gonna reclaim some, some space here. So this second call up box is just talking a little bit about you know, good practices for files and directories. The number one rule is don't use white space in your file or directory names. You can use a dash which is you know, this character or an underscore. I prefer dashes, but you know, pick one and be consistent. Um, don't, begin, um, don't begin file names with dash. And the reason for that is in bash stuff, that, things that start with the dash indicate typically options or flags. So that's going to confuse uh, the, the shell program. Uh, if you have files or folders that begin with the dash, um, and stick with letters and numbers, um, periods and dashes or underscores. So we're going to encounter some special characters later, but there are loads of special characters um, in the shell scripting language. And if you move beyond like just letters and numbers, periods, dashes and underscores, then things might work. Your commands might, do, might, might not do what you expect them to do. Um, and um, this question was asked earlier, but if you do need to refer to names of files or directories that have spaces or special characters, you can surround them in uh, double quotes. Um, right, okay. So we talked about creating a directory. So now let's talk about creating a file. So um, let us change into the thesis directory. And in our thesis directory, we're gonna create a file called uh, draft.txt. So um, to do this, we need to use a, um, a text editor in order to create and edit a file. So um, 
course, within JupyterLab, we have a GUI interface. We could actually create some text files and use a standard text editor and save them and whatnot. Um, we'll talk about how to do that in the Python workshop. Um, but for now, I'm going to pretend that all we had access to was a terminal, whether like we were on Ibex or Shaheen, um, and we only really had access to the terminal. That's all we could do. So we're going to use a little text editor called Nano. And so you type to use Nano, you type the name of the program, and then you type the name of the file that you want to create and then edit. So in this case, it'd be draft.txt and hit enter. And so now we've been dropped into a simple um, command line text editor. And we can you know, type some stuff. So I'll just type, uh, it's not publish or perish anymore. Um, it's share. Okay, done. Okay, and now, so um, there are some keyboard shortcuts that you have to use to actually um, exit the program and, uh, and save your file. And these are actually discussed over here. So we've typed some text and now we want to, um, we want to exit or um, go back to the terminal. We can do this by hitting the control or the CTRL or the you know, caret key. Um, and so at the, if you hit on your keyboard, if you hit control, say um, control O, which is for write out. So if I did control and then O, then you'll notice that it changed to file name to write. So now we're gonna write this file draft.txt. So if you hit enter, and now we've saved a file. So that's the equivalent of like a save, which would typically be control S in like Windows or, um, or Mac or Linux or other, other um, word processing software. So control O will write out. And then if we do a control X, we can exit and go back. So a little, a little clunky, um, but for the purposes of today and just doing some simple text editing, it's fine. Um, there are some quite advanced command line text editors called like Vim or Emacs uh, or things like that, that you can install and use that are very, very powerful, but have very steep learning curves. Um, what I find myself doing increasingly when working on remote, um, in remote computing environments is actually running um, a version of say Microsoft Visual Studio Code Server um, or using something like Jupyter Lab. Um, or other kind of remote first text editors. Um, and we'll have some training videos on our YouTube channel on how to do that. Um, and then, like I said, we'll talk about some of them. Uh, we'll talk about JupyterLab in particular um, next, um, in a couple of weeks. Okay, so now we've created this file. Um, and So now we've created this file. So now if we run ls to list the contents of the thesis directory, we can see that this file draft.txt is there. Um, there is, so there's an exercise here about um, a different way to create files. So I'll just kind of go through it in the interest of time. So there's a program called touch that you can use to create files Um, and what touch does is it, it basically just creates the file uh, without opening it. So it's just created an empty file. And so here you can see that the draft.txt file has 64 bytes. And the myfile.txt has uh, zero bytes. So it's just a completely empty file, basically. OK, um, so what's in a name? So this is just talking about how um, file extensions are more conventions for human humans and not necessarily indicative of the content of the file. So um, 
you know, we created a draft.txt just as a convention where .txt is a conventional file extension for just a, a flat text file. You know, other types of files like PDF or PNG uh, or MP3, um, you know, these other file extensions, it, it, it could very well mean that that file um, has a particular encoding like PDF or PNG, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, we could have, um, you know, we could have done something like uh, something weird, like nano um, my photo dot PNG. And, you know, this is not going to be a photo of me. And then I could save that file. And now if I do ls uh, dash f. So here, so because I've made this a dot PNG, you know, some computer programs might think that this actually is a PNG file. And if I and would try to open it with a um, with a um, uh, with some kind of photo viewer, but it would work because actually this isn't a PNG file at all. It's just a text file that I created and gave it a weird extension. Um, and so we can remove this file. We'll talk about remove more uh, in a minute, but we can just remove it by using an R, the rm command to remove that file. And now you can see that it's gone. Okay. Okay, so moving files and directories. Okay, so let's go um, up one level in our file system hierarchy using the dot dot. And let's see where we are. Okay, so we want to um, rename draft.txt and change the name of draft.txt to quotes.txt. So we, we use a command MV, which is short for move, to do that. Um, so if we type move or MV, and then the path to the file that we want to move Come on. Followed by a space, followed by the path to the file or the directory or where we want to move a file. So, if we were going to just move this file, we would put some other directory here. But if we want to rename it, we can just provide the name of a file. And then, if we do an ls on the thesis directory, we'll see that we have renamed draft.txt to quotes.txt. Now, so that was renaming, but if we wanted to move the thesis um, now quotes.txt, let's say we wanted to move it out of the thesis directory and into the current directory. So the current directory we can refer to with a single dot. And so if we run that command, now we'll see that the thesis directory does not contain the quotes.txt file, but our current directory does. So there's the quote.txt file. So we moved it basically from its previous location to a new location. Okay. Okay. So there's an exercise there, um, which I'm going to skip uh, in the interest of time and move forward to copying files and directories. We have some uh, other exercises that we'll work on here uh, in a minute. So where, so we did, 
Mm -hmm. Copying files and directories. Okay, so there's a command cp for copy, and this command works a lot like the move command, except that instead of moving a file from A to B, it copies the contents of the file from A to B, leaving the original file intact. Um, so let's see some examples. So if we do ls, so we can see we have our, our quotes.txt file is there. Um, let's suppose that we want to copy that file to uh, thesis to the thesis directory, but we want to change the name. So instead of quotes.txt, we'll do um, quotations.txt. This is just to demonstrate that you can change the name and copy at the same time. Okay. So now if we run ls, so we can see that the quotes.txt is, is still there. And if we look at the thesis directory, then this new file quotations.txt is there. And we'll, we'll, I'll show you in a minute how to quickly look at those files and know that they're the same. Um, okay, so we talked about copying a single file, but often you wanna copy like a whole directory. So for example, if we wanted to make, let's suppose that this thesis directory contained like our entire thesis. So all of our files and everything for the thesis, and we wanted to make a backup of that. Well, we could do a copy followed by a dash R for recursive, which means recursively copy any files inside of the, of the directory, and then go into any subdirectories of that directory and copy any files there, and go into any subdirectories of the subdirectories and copy any files there, and so on and so forth until you reach a directory that contains only files, and then copy those files. So we want to copy the thesis directory into a new directory called thesis backup. And now if now we have uh, thesis and thesis backup, and if we were to compare thesis and thesis backup, we'll see that um, these directories contain the same files, which is what we would hope. Yeah. And here, actually, I've not shown you this before, but with the ls command, you can actually provide um, multiple arguments, so multiple directories, say, that you want to list the contents of, and then you'll get the results back like this. So you have each directory followed by the contents of that directory. And I think even if you do like um, options, so let's suppose we did um, LHF, then you get the specified options applied to each of the directories, and then you'll get the results back like this. OK. So let's take a few minutes and take a look at these two exercises, so renaming files and moving and copying files. And um, they're, these are not exercises that you necessarily need to type commands in in order to solve. You kind of just need to think through them, um, but try to think about you know, what the commands do and um, what commands might you need to type in order to solve these, these exercises. And I'll make a Put a little timer. And okay, so let's take three minutes and have a look at those exercises. Um, so while you guys are working on those exercises, just some questions in the chat. So copying a file in the same name replace the file saved in the same folder. Yes. So if you copy, um, so copying, this doesn't, you know, copying a file and overwriting the file just creates a copy of the same file. So that's not so bad. If you move a file to a different directory, to a file that already exists, then you will overwrite the file that's there. Uh, and that's typically bad uh, because then you might've lost data. Um, 
but it will overwrite. Um, So feel free to ask any other questions while we're just kind of taking a bit of downtime while you work on these exercises. So there's a question in the chat about what command to label the, the colored folders. Um, so the coloring, so I guess the question is asking about the, the, the different coloring of the folders and things like that. Um, that's, that's a configuration option of the shell itself, not a command that we ran. And it kind of differs depending on what operating system you're on. So I, I didn't go into the details. Um, the only, the, the, com the command and option that we talked about was to use the dash F um, option, which will add these like trailing slashes, or we haven't seen, we haven't seen any executable files yet. Um, um, but actually maybe, maybe there's one in this directory. Yeah, so here we have some executable files which are colored green but have this asterisk after that. So these are these are files that are actual programs that you can run. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the color coding itself is, is a configuration option of the shell that depends on the operating system. Excuse me, Deb. I mean, uh, like the, uh, all the files and directories that we have, I mean, got training uh, about it. It is in, in, the, in, the, in the machine of the cows. I mean, after the training course, could we, I mean, get access to that uh, public uh, kind of directories? Of? So I think you're asking um, about getting access to data at cows after this training is done. Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes, because I mean, I have made some directories and I'm not sure if I'm going to get back to them or not after the training course. Ah, so this, these, um, yeah. So the data that you create here on these cloud instances, you're not gonna get back. So once you've created it, once, the, once this workshop is done and you close your browser tab, then all that data is gonna go away. And um, that's just because the, the cloud computing instances are not storing any data um, anywhere. Um, that's, that is persistent. So unfortunately, any data that you create here will be lost once the workshop is done. Does that, is that the question that you had or did you have a different Yes, question? yes, because I have, I mean, uh, PC, I'm working with my PC now. I'm, I don't know how to, I mean, extract them to, to my machine. And that's uh, the reason. Ah, yeah, OK. So I mean, the reality is with the, I mean, you shouldn't be creating any, any data that you really care about and want to keep after this workshop. I mean, the, the purposes of the data that we create here is mostly just for learning um, and not, um, not for kind of keeping or, or, or storing around. Yeah, OK, OK. OK, Thank you. yep. Okay, so let's take a look at these exercises. So renaming files. So suppose you create a plain text file in your current directory um, and you wanna analyze it. And the file is gonna be named 
statistics.txt. But after you create the file, you realize you misspelled the name. So you want to correct your mistake. So which command that would you use? So we've learned copy and we learned move. And so the copy command is not the right command. Um, it's the move command that we want to use. So we can move a file from a name where it's misspelled like this. And we can rename it with the same um, um, with the same command to rename the file and correct the misspelling. If we use the copy command, we would create a new file, statistics.txt, that didn't have the misspelling, but we would still have this file around, which we probably don't want. Whereas with the move command, we would basically replace this file with a file whose contents are the same, but whose name is different. Um, so moving and copying. So we're given a sequence of commands. So pwd. So we're in this slash users Jamie's data file. And we run ls in that file. And we see that there's this file called proteins.dat. And then we run a, um, a sequence of commands. So we make a directory. Then we move the proteins.dat file into the recombined directory that we just created. And then we copy the file to the parent directory of our current directory to a file proteins.saved.dat. So there's a lot going on. And then we run ls on the current directory. So maybe we should do this one by um, we should actually do this one with the commands. OK. So let's just, um, I'm going to make a directory. But instead of making a directory called, uh, OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to touch a file called proteins.dat. OK, and so that's just going to create this this file proteins.dat in the current directory. OK, and then I'm going to follow the sequence of commands over here. So I'm going to do make dir uh, recombine. And so now we can see here's this recombine directory that we just created. And now I'm going to use the move command to move the proteins.dat file into the recombine directory. OK. So now we can see that our proteins.dat file is gone. And if we look at the recombined directory, we can see that the proteins.dat file is there. So now let's run uh, whoop, this second command, where we are going to copy recombined proteins.dat file to the parent directory. Proteins saved.dat file. And now we're going to run ls. So we have recombined, but um, no proteins files. Because we the first command we ran, this move command, moved the proteins.dat into the recombined. And then the second command that we ran copied that file to the parent directory. So you can see, so here's that file that we copied from recombined proteins.dat. We copied that file to the parent directory of our current directory and renamed it at the same time to protein saved. OK. Let's move on to the next section, removing files and directories. We talked about creating. Um, now we need to talk about destroying. So let's ls. OK, so let us 
remove this quote.txt file that we created. So we can do rm for remove quotes.txt. And now we can see that the quote.txt file that was previously there is now gone. And we could see if we try to you know, list that file, it would just tell us so that file doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Now, one thing that differentiates the rm command from say deleting a file or a folder on with like a GUI, like a right click, you know, move to trash or something like that, is that for all intents and purposes, deleting with rm is forever. So there is no uh, you know recycle bin or trash can or or whatever that you might have on an operating system where you delete a file and it kind of goes into this temporary delete location and it's not really gone until you empty the the bin. Um, when you delete with RM, you're deleting forever. So you're what what happens at the storage level is that the memory address space that holds the data in that file is released. And at that point, the operating system can come in and clean it up or not, depending on the operating system and how, how often it, it collects um, released memory space or released disk, disk space. But you have to be you know, a proper computer forensic uh, scientist, so to speak, to uh, to be able to recover deleted or recover files that are deleted with RM. And in many cases, you won't be able to recover. Okay, so how can we use um, this RM command safely? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can kind of throw a, um, um, you can make the, you can make the, uh, the program ask you for confirmation. So suppose, that we try to remove from our thesis backup this quotations.txt file. So we can add an option dash i. And whenever we do rm dash i, we are going to be prompted do you want to remove this file or not? And so you have to actually think about it and then type y for yes or n for no. And if you type n for no, then it won't delete the file. And we can confirm that by just looking at the thesis backup. So that's that's one way that you can uh, uh, protect yourself from accidentally deleting files. Um, let's suppose that we try to run this command, rm thesis. Well, so this is a way that the uh, the authors of the remove program have tried to protect you from data loss. So remove will only remove files. It will not without extra options, remove a whole directory. So in this case, if you accidentally type that, you would be saved. Um, you would be saved from, from removing a whole directory. However, like copy that had this recursive option of recursively copying uh, files and then going into subdirectories and copying those files, there is a, um, a recursive option for RM where we can recursively remove the files from a directory and then enter into any subdirectories within that directory, remove those files and so on and so forth. And then once we have empty directories, we can remove all the empty directories. So if we would run that, now we have completely blown away our thesis. And so it was a good thing that we backed it up. Okay. So rm-r should be used with, with great caution. Um, and, you know, so, you know, use it with caution, basically. There are many cases where it's really handy. You really do want to delete a directory and, uh, and everything in it, and then it's the right tool for the job. But just be sure that you really want to delete the directory and all the files before you run that command. And you can always toss in a dash i if you want to have some prompting about specific files. Okay. Um, so there are some, let me just take a quick. Um, 
So there's a, a comment in the chat that working with the terminal is risky business. It it is, but it's like any um, um, it's like the, the terminal is a the shell is a power tool, you know. And like any power tool, if you you know learn to use it correctly and responsibly, you can do awesome things with it. But if you don't know how to use it and you use it irresponsibly, you can also cause great damage. So, you know, just as if you take a chainsaw out and try to cut down a tree and have no idea what you're doing, you're more than likely to cut your leg off than to cut the tree down. It's the same with the shell. So if you come to training workshops like this and you learn how to use it um, properly, then you can do some awesome things with it that you, um, things that you wouldn't be able to do in any other way, particularly with computing systems like Ibex and Shaheen or with cloud computing. But, you know, if you don't know how to use it properly, you could delete the entire file system on your heart, on your computer with a single command. So, you know, proper training, important. Okay, so we have some examples. So there's an exercise here. So copying with multiple file names. Um, and I will leave that for you to go through kind of on your own, I think. And because I want to talk about wildcards and pattern matching. So um, one of the ways um, in which you can do it, uh, the same thing on many files at once without actually having to type out all the files that you want to process is with wildcards. So often you will have things like, I would like to do the same task to all the CSV files in my directory. So all the comma separated file files, or I want to analyze all of these .pdb files in the same way, something like this. So the way that you can do that is to use a star or an asterisk wildcard and then .pdb or .csv or something like this. And that will allow you to apply a single program to potentially millions of files with one line of code. And there are other wild cards. So like you can use the question mark, which matches um, exactly one character, um, things like this. So um, let's, let's see some examples. So if let's look at this, uh, um, this exercise here. So I think there is a directory called molecules. So if we look in the molecules directory, um, we can see that there are all of these, uh, these PDB files. So we could list all of the files that match uh, this pattern. We could, so that would be any file that ends in .pdb. We could also match any file that starts with zero or more characters, then has a T in it, then has you know, zero or more characters and ends in A and E .pdb. We could do the same thing, except we would say it has to have zero or more characters followed by a T, followed by exactly one character, and then ends in ne.pdb. Then we could do, um, let's do the next one, would be um, zero more characters followed by a t, followed by exactly two characters followed by ne.pdb. That gives you the same thing. That wasn't a super interesting one. Um, so anyway, so there's all these different kinds of pattern matching. And so here, we're, we're, we're not doing anything super advanced. We're just passing all these files into the ls command. But, you know, let's look at, you know, clear this out. So consider for a moment um, molecules star dot pdp okay so suppose that instead of only six dot pdb files suppose there was a million pdb files and then suppose instead of ls this was some analysis program that accepted a list of files to be processed um, then with a single line 
we could process a million files with a particular statistics program. And we'll, we'll see an example of that um, later on this afternoon, about 30 or 40 minutes. But that kind of gives you a sense of the, the utility of, uh, of Bash. OK. Um, well, let's look at these exercises. OK, so let's take, I'm going to give you five minutes to look over these, uh, these exercises, because I think this is the end of the, the episode. Um, and then I'll wrap up with the commands that we, we looked at. So um, there is, so I kind of went through this first one, um, but there's some more practice with wildcards, um, organizing files in directories, um, and then reproducing a folder structure. So if you wanted to go through here and, and, and you know, think about how you could use make dir or copy commands um, to uh, reproduce the folder structure here, um, you could give that a go. So I'll give you five minutes to, to have a look at those, uh, at those exercises. And um, I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing my screen for now. And yeah, feel free to uh, ask questions if you have any. And I'm just going to set a timer for five minutes. And if no one has questions, I'll just sit here and drink my tea. And I'll also go ahead and pause the recording if no one has questions, so there's not dead space. Okay, so we're back. So hopefully you, you took a few minutes to, to look at those, um, at those exercises. Um, so there's a question in the chat. So what is the purpose of the dash A option in copy? And I have absolutely no idea. I've never used that option before, but let me share my screen and we will make an inquiry. So if we do copy and then dash dash help, let us look up here and see. Um, so the dash A option is short for dash dash archive, which is the same as dash D capital R dash dash preserve all. So let us look even deeper. So dash D is same as no dereference preserve links. Okay, so let's come down here to no dereference. Never follow symbolic links. And okay, so it seems like It seems like the dash A or dash dash <clears throat> archive option um, does re a recursive copy. So here's the, the dash R. So it does a recursive copy and then does this fancy thing, which is no dereference or dash D, which is short for dash dash no dereference dash dash preserve links. So it, it's like copying, if you have a, a directory which contains not just files and directories, but more exotic stuff like symbolic links um, or other references to other directories somewhere else on the file system. So like we, we haven't talked about symbolic links or, um, or hard links, but their symbolic links and hard links are, are basically ways to create like little tunnels between parts of the file system. So you can make it appear as if one directory lives inside another when in fact it doesn't. Um, there are some good good use cases for that. I, I don't use links myself very often because I, I don't find them often to be terribly useful, but you they're they're there for a reason. Um, they do have some use cases. So if you wanted to copy all the files, including all any like links, symbolic links or soft links or hard links, then you would want to use that option. So 
Um, but that's going a little bit too deep down the rabbit hole of, of copying and talking about symbolic links and hard links and stuff like that. Then I would want to go in this class. Okay. Um, right. So let us, let me just summarize um, this episode and then we'll move on to the next one. So the key points, so we learned several new commands uh, in this episode. So copy, um, make, dir, move, and remove. So copy copies a file from an old location to a new location. Um, make, dir uh, creates a new directory. Or if you, we saw some examples of where you could use argument or options to create an entire path, not just, a, or a, a sequence of new directories. You can use move to, move a file or directory from an old location to a new location. And you can use RM to remove um, files. Uh, we talked about some wild cards. So in particular, the star wild card and the question mark wild card. Um, we're going to see more examples of those in the following episodes. Um, so the shell does not have a trash bin. Once you delete something, it's, it's basically gone. Um, not easily recoverable. And uh, and we used we we saw how to use a simple text editor called Nano, um, but depending on the type of work that you do, Nano is probably not going to get it done. Um, you're probably going to need something more more complicated, or, or not more complicated, but more um, perhaps even less complicated but more powerful, um, like Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Um, and many many uh, modern text editors can be made to run on remote servers. Um, but run locally in like a web browser or something like that. And we have some videos on our YouTube channel that walk you through the process, mostly aimed at users here at KAUST who might want to run Microsoft Visual Studio Code on IBEX, um, for example, to do development work there, um, rather than using something like Nano or um, tools like Vim or Emacs. Okay, so moving right along. Let me uh, clear. Clear this out. Okay, so episode four, pipes and filters. So this is one of my favorite um, favorite episodes um, because it really starts to give you uh, an example of the power of of the shell. So we're gonna instead of looking at you know individual commands, we're going to see how we can combine um, combine multiple commands together to create little pipelines that process data. Um, so we're going to see a number of, of kind of the building blocks of doing that. We're going to see how to redirect commands output to a file. Um, we're going to make some pipelines with multiple stages. And, um, and then talk about at the end, the philosophy of small pieces loosely joined, which is the way to think about how you can combine these Unix commands together. And there's going to be an analogy made to Lego bricks. And this analogy has been very influential because many of the, the data uh, processing tools that we're going to see, like Python and uh, the Pandas library in Python or other libraries and uh, the tidyverse, if you are interested in R, um, data analysis in R, um, big data tools like Spark and Dask, they all have this like, um, um, small pieces loosely joined philosophy where you, you take individual small programs that do one thing well and combine them together to create more complicated programs that can do uh, more advanced things very well. Okay, so but let's get started with this. So we want to change into our molecules or no, we want to, where are we? So we're in the data directory. The data directory has this molecules directory and we want to look at the molecules directory. Okay, um, so we have these molecule, we have these files and um, let's change directories and go into the molecules directory. Okay, so we're gonna look at a simple program um, called word count. So let's run the word count program on kubane.pdb. Uh, so uh, the word count program gives us the um, 
number of lines, the number of words, and the number of characters in a file or files. In this case, we only ask for a single file, Kubane. And so that is the number of lines, the number of words, and the number of characters in the Kubane file. Now, because we know wildcards, instead of manually listing out the files uh, one after the other, we can just do a wildcard and then pattern match on the extension. And now we will get the output, number of lines, number of words, number of characters for any file that matches the pattern that we put in, star.pdb. So this would work on one file, on six files, on a million files, and it would give you, it would do the same thing with one line. So that's pretty cool. Now, suppose that we don't so much care about the, um, the number of words or the number of characters, but we just care about the number of lines. And uh, I use the same command sometimes when I want to know if I have a bunch of like uh, CSV files, so like comma separated value files uh, that I need to analyze as part of some machine learning pipeline, then I might want to know like how big are these files, but not necessarily by the size in like gigabytes, but something more, more useful for analysis, so like the number of observations in the data. So usually these CSV files are, are organized in terms of like one, each row or each line in the file is one kind of observation of, of data. And so by counting the number of lines in all the files, you get a sense of like how many observations you have to work with. So if I had, you know, a thousand CSV files in a directory, which is, you know, not unusual. And then I can quickly say, okay, well, maybe I have, you know, 100,000 total observations spread across these thousand files or something like that with this single line. So here we can see that we have, you know, 107 total lines distributed across uh, six different files. Okay. And then there's other options for characters and words if you, if you want. Okay. Um, so if you type uh, word count, say dash L and then don't type anything, just hit enter. Um, what's happening here is that the word count program is expecting you as the user to type in some input for it to analyze. So typically you make this mistake by accident. You don't actually want to literally type in some input to the word count program. So the easiest way uh, uh, to get out of this is just to hit the control key and hit C. And then that basically just kills that command and gives you your prompt back. Okay, so this entire workshop, we've been running commands and getting the output back into the, into the terminal itself. And that's okay for, for commands where you don't have a lot of output, but if you have like a thousand files and you ran this word count program on a thousand files, you'd have a thousand lines of output, which would be a lot to look through. So it might be better at that point to start redirecting the output from the terminal to some file. So we can do that. Um, as follows. So if we wanted to redirect this output to a file, we use the, like, you can think of it as the, like, a, you know, a greater than or less than character, but I think of it as like an arrow because you want to basically um, send the output from the terminal to the direction of this file, which maybe we call it uh, length.txt. Make this just a little bigger. Okay, so now if we do um, an ls, we can see that here we have this length.txt file, which we just created. And there's a, another command called cat, which you can use to just look at a file. So if we do cat on length.txt, it just kind of dumps the output back to the screen. So it allows us to just look at the file that we just created. Okay. Um, so there's another command uh, called sort. <clears throat> so we're going to sort the output of the length.txt file. 
And so instead of going through this exercise, let's see what, what, what happens. So if we use the sort command on the lengths.txt file, um, well, now I'm down at the bottom of the screen again. Let me get rid of this. It's clear. So if we do sort on the lengths.txt file, what do we get? So this is kind of not what we were expecting, right? So we were probably intuitively expecting that the sort would do some kind of like numeric sort on the lengths of the file or the lengths of the, the number of lines in each file. And what we got back instead was something a little bit odd. And what, it, what we got back is by default with sort, it does something called um, uh, basically alphanumerical um, sort where it compares um uh, it doesn't do the kind of numeric sort that we that we want basically so if we want numeric sort we can look at the help menu for sort and see that in here there is a dash n which is short for dash dash numeric sort so we could do a sort numeric sort Remind me later. Uh, numeric sort lengths.txt or the shorthand, which would be uh, sort dash n lengths.txt. And so this does a um, what we would what we kind of intuitively expected would be to sort from low to high the output of the of the links.txt file or the contents of links.txt file. Okay. So um, we could <clears throat> redirect this, this output again and redirect it to something called sorted links if we wanted to re redirect this output to a file. And then we could use the cat command to look at sorted links. Um, that's fine so you know we could keep we could keep creating these intermediate files and here oh so we can see that i've actually made a typo in the uh in the so if we do ls sorted length so there's a typo in here so we can actually uh, move this and fix the typo There we go. So now I've, I've fixed the typo there. Um, so let's learn a new command. So suppose that what we wanted to do was identify the shortest file from our list of files. So basically we want, the answer we want is nine methane. We wanna know that that methane file is the shortest file. Well, there's a command called head, which takes um, um, an argument like the number of lines, the number of first lines in the file that you want to select off. And so there, so this is basically selecting off the first line in the file. So head dash n one takes the first line off in the file. So that gives us our answer. Um, but maybe we can get this answer a little bit simpler. And that's what we're going to talk about next by basically doing a single line without creating all these intermediate files to get the answer that we want. Okay. Um, okay. So before we get that though, let's talk about just a couple of extra things. So. Uh, don't redirect to the same file. So that's going to, to, to basically read data and then overwrite the same file. Like that's going to create weird, uh, weird results. So don't redirect to the same file. And there is, um, we looked at this operator. There's an operator where you basically have two of those and it works a little bit differently. And um, you can work through this exercise um, 
on your own to, if you want to really kind of see what happens. But um, it basically is overwrite versus append. So if you redirect using a single um, you know, arrow operator, it will overwrite the contents of the file. If you use two arrows, it, it appends the contents to the file. So you can use these two arrow operator to kind of build up a text file with output, um, which you know, we might, we'll see an example of that, I think, in a little bit of how to do that in a loop. OK. Um, and I'm just going to skip this exercise, I think, because I want to talk about pipes. So. Instead of all this redirection, what we could do is we could use the pipe operator to, to pass the output of one command in as the input to the next command. So what I mean by this is, so let's look at our, our previous command. So instead of using sorted lengths and passing that as the input to the head command, We can come back here and we can type sort numerically of length.txt and use the pipe command or the pipe operator to redirect the output of the sort command to the input of the head command. And so that gives us the same answer. Now we can actually come here and replace length.txt. with the command that we used to create length.txt, which was word count dash L star PDB, and then pipe. Okay, there we go. So now with this pipe operator, we've created, we've, we have three little Lego bricks. The first Lego brick is the word count program that uh, calculates the number of lines in each PDB file. We then use the pipe operator to redirect that output and pass it in as the input to the sort numeric program, which sorts those results numerically. And when, then we use the pipe operator to pass those output or that output in as the input to the head dash n one command, which just pulls off the first line. So we've built up this pipeline of this data analysis pipeline, which takes a whole bunch of files as inputs and filters it down to an answer, in this case, a single line. Hmm. Have I lost my, I seem to have lost my connection. All right. Well, I will have to go back and get another one. Okay. Uh, let me get my terminal back. And let me change into introduction shell, data, molecules. Okay. Now I've lost all of those, inconveniently lost all of those intermediate files that I just created. Instead of recreating them again, though, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to write out the program. So we're going to do the word count on star PDB, we're going to pipe that to sort numerically, and then we're going to pipe that to head and one to get methane. All right, so there's a question in the chat. So word count, you know, can this option be used for any type of file extension, for instance, a, a PDF? Um, and then is it possible to read the word count in between the lines? So, um, so the first answer is, you know, yes, you can apply it to um, any kind of file extension, but 
you might not get the result that you think that you're going to get. So like, for example, with a PDF file. So a PDF file that we opened with a PDF viewer and looked at might have, let's say, 100 lines of text on that page. But if you actually look at the raw encoding of the PDF file, it could have 10,000 lines because it has a bunch of metadata and other stuff that's particular to the .pdf file format, which we don't see when we use a PDF viewer to look at the file because the PDF viewer knows how to translate that kind of PDF representation into something that looks nice when we look at it. Um, so that's the answer to the first question. The second question is, um, yes. So if you want to count the, oh, the word, the word count uh, between the lines. Um, so you can count the number of words with, I think, the dash M option. So um, if we wanted to, yeah, let's do this. So this gives the number of words, but this is the number of words across all the lines. So if you wanted to get the number of words per line, um, the average number of words per line, that might be, uh, be easily doable. But if you wanted to count exactly the number of words on each line, I'd have to think a little bit about how about how to do that sensibly. Um, so hopefully that answer is kind of roughly answers those questions. Okay, so let's, um, so we talked about the pipe and we talked about combining multiple commands. We saw examples of how to do that. So here's a nice um, a graphic that explains how this works. So, you know, we, we built this up, this pipeline up by first running a command, dumping the output to the shell. And then we um, uh, redirected the, uh, the output to a file. And then we saw how we could use the pipe character to combine these little Lego bricks to create um, output that we return to the shell. And notice that the volume of output goes down as you move through the pipeline. So you start out with maybe, you know, in our case, it was six, but you might start out with like millions of files or thousands of files. And then you reduce that to, you know, the word count program takes in all these files and reduces it to one line per file. The sort program rearranges those lines. And then the last program selects only a subset of those lines. So you're kind of reducing the data as you move through the pipeline. And this is very common in, in data analytics where, you start out with a large amount of data, potentially, um, potentially very large amount of data in like scientific applications. And then the analysis pipeline reduces that volume of data until you get down to a, either a particular subset of data or a more manageable um, portion of, of data for later analysis. And someone pointed out in the chat that actually the dash M is for character and the dash W is for word count, which makes more sense upon looking at it. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, just kind of glancing through here. Okay. So, what I want to do is, is I want to get down to um, Nell's pipeline. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So this the section on tools designed to work together. So this is the um, in, in Unix, the philosophy of software design and program design is that you could create a bunch of small programs that do one thing and do one thing well. And then you can combine these tools together to do more complicated things. So when you're thinking about how to write code um, and to solve, uh, write data analysis code to solve your research problems, you should think about how to um, break up your program into small pieces that 
each of it, where each piece does one particular part of your analysis, and then you combine them all together to do your whole program. It's, a, it's easier to reason about and easier to write correct programs if you think about how to, if you think about writing programs in this way. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, these are really nice exercises. I encourage you to kind of work through them on your own, but I want to go, I want to actually go through the science application, which uses pipes and filters. Um, so let's, let's do that now. Um, okay. So I'm just going to clear this out. So let's get out of this directory and go into the North Pacific Gyre directory and then into the uh, OK, so this is the directory that actually has her, her raw data that she collected. OK, so let's use our word count program um, to count the number of lines in all the text files. Okay, and um, so the output has one line for each file, and they all, at a glance, they all look like they have about 300 lines. Um, but what we could do is we could kind of verify that. So we glance at it and we think, okay, well, they all have 300 lines. So, but let's just check. So if they didn't have 300 lines, then we could sort the output numerically um, and then any shorter files should rise to the top. So let's just look at the first five lines. Oh, and we see that indeed there is one file that only has 240 lines. So um, when you have uh, when you have files that are generated by analysis um, instruments, like in a lab, like we have here in, in various core labs in Cal. It's often the case that each file has the same structure or maybe even the same length. And so one of the first things that you should always do before you start doing data analysis on your data is actually make sure that you're not working with garbage input data. So you need to actually check that files um, have been properly processed, that they have the expected you know, dimensions or, or lengths or that they're not corrupted in some way. So this is kind of, I'm showing you how to use the the, these little programs that we have learned today to kind of check and do a little bit of, of um, exploring to make sure that the data is not garbage. Okay. And you might have glance, you know, this is only like 18 files, and you might have been able to spot that there is this file here that was shorter. But if this was a thousand files or a million files, like you'd have no chance of just being able to kind of scan through and pick out files that were of different sizes. Okay, so now that we have figured out that there are files, some files are shorter than others, we might want to check to see whether any are longer. So we could use tail to look at the last five. So if there are any files that had longer than 300 lines, they would show up here at the bottom. And so we don't see any of those. So we can conclude that there are no files that are longer than 300 lines. Good. Um, but when we look at this, we notice that there's uh, a Z at the end of this file. So many um, analysis programs will spit out files where the file name is structured in a very particular way. And that's for scientists to be able to analyze the without actually analyzing the content of the files, but to be able to analyze the file names and understand whether the file is corrupt or not. So for example, the, the machine that uh, Nell used to analyze her raw samples, if it finds a corrupt sample, it spits out an output file that ends in a Z. So we don't want to include any files that end in a Z in, um, um, in analysis. So we can use wildcards to, um, to accomplish that. So, we want to make sure that you know any files that we use in analysis follow this pattern. So they either end in a.txt or they end in b.txt. Anything else is, is corrupt, and we'll we'll leave those alone. 
Okay. And we'll see an example of how to um, do a, a, a single line wildcard pattern match for that. So we could do list um, in E and E uh, star a dot txt and then b dot txt. But actually, there's a way that we can do a or b with square brackets, I think. So this putting the A and or B in square brackets is a, is a, a, a shortcut to do the um, uh, the pattern, you know, star A or star B. Okay. So then this is the wild card that we'll use later to filter out the files that we actually want to analyze. Okay. Um, so we talked about a lot in this. We talked about word count. Um, cat, sort, head, and tail programs. We saw how to redirect output to a file using two different operators. So the, the single arrow or the kind of greater than operator will uh, redirect output to a file and overwrite any existing content. Whereas the double arrow operator or the greater than greater than operator um, will um, append output to a file. And then the pipe character, which is the really important one, is how you chain together these different pieces to create entire pipelines for data analysis. Okay, any questions about that before we move on to the, the next episode? Okay, well, I guess we'll just move on. Great. Okay, so I have a text file. I want to go through it line by line and add word star underscore gene to each line. And I want to add numeric counting uh, in that to go like word. Hmm. Um, Uh, so Amal, so this, so this is a very, a very specific question, um, and I believe you're here at Calst. So it might be something that you can shoot me an email or, um, or send something on the IBEX Slack, uh, um, Slack channel, and we can uh, sort that out. I don't, I can't think of. I'm not entirely sure. I understand what you want to do. I, I'm not sure I could come up with a working example to demonstrate to everybody off the top of my head. Oh, you're not at Counts. We have somebody with a very similar name at Counts. Hmm. Um, hmm. OK, well, let me ruminate on that problem. And then maybe um, when we have a next short break, I'll see if I can come up with a, a, working, uh, a working solution. Uh, yeah, David. Yes. Um... So uh, we've seen an example where I want to match uh, A or B on a single yes. character. Now, if we go back to the molecules folder, we've created two text files, maybe other types of files. Yes. If I want to list all the files that are not ending with .pdb so that I can go ahead, pipe them, and delete them, how do I do that? Right. Um Hmm, that's a good question. So how do you, okay, so let's do that. So um, well, let's go back up two levels and down into molecules. And uh, let's suppose that we had uh, lengths.txt and sorted lengths.txt. Okay. So basically, you created all these intermediate files, and you want to um, remove them. But let's suppose that um, uh, the sorted lengths txt was sorted um, lengths dot uh, I don't know CSV something. So it basically has a different 
Um, so you can't obviously pattern match on the file extension. OK, and so what you want to do is basically you want to filter out this directory that contains raw data and intermediate data files, and you want to delete these two files. Right? That's, you you yeah, want to basically exactly. say something like um, rm um, star dot pdb, but not. Exactly, yes. How um, do I say not dot pdb? Uh, maybe this is this exercise too bad. No. Uh, hmm. Well, let us consult Google. Uh, pattern match shell not operator. Let's see what this comes back. Uh, how do I make this looks potentially helpful? Uh, how do I negate a task with regular expressions? Uh, hmm. I don't think that's going to work. So, all right. So let's try this. So since the remove command is dangerous, let's not let's not play around with it. So if we try, I'm guessing this is yeah, that's not gonna work. Um so Here is the official pattern matching manual. So matches any string, matches any single character. Ah, matches anything except one of the given patterns. So then pattern list. So maybe. I feel like we're getting very close. Let's have an example here. Hmm. So for sure you use the exclamation point, but I just can't get the uh, the syntax quite right. Pattern match shell. I'll take a look for this on the um, on the breaker. I'll try to come up, figure out how to do this. But it's something like um, it has to be something very close to uh, to what we have here, but not quite, because clearly the Inside PDP. Yeah. Hmm. It's something close to this, but I can't quite get the syntax now. Um, hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's frustrating. But that's close. That's headed in the right direction. Um, okay. So, any other questions?
is it possible that you need to use the not the square bracket but the um rounded bracket it's possible let's try it no So the thing is that the exclamation point does many things in bash and um, wait, I wonder if this might work. No. Hmm. Yeah, I'm a bit at a loss. I know that this is like very close, but I think it's, it would probably take me another five minutes of Googling and I don't, I don't want to spend five minutes googling on this right now, but something like that. But the way the way that I would always test out this kind of thing would be to use the ls command, because obviously what, what you want to when you get it right with the ls command, you will know that you will list out um, the two these two files, and then you go back and you use the remove command. So you, you don't you never play around and test stuff with remove command because who knows what will happen. You know, you always test with something like LS where the uh, the consequences are not severe if it does something screwy. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Loops. All right. So it's about 4.15 and I doubt we're going to get through loops and shell scripts, um, but we'll see. Okay, so let's um, clear. Okay, so loops. So we're going to see how to perform the same action over many different files. And um, we're going to talk about loops today. And we're also going to talk about loops quite a lot in detail on. Um, um, on two weeks from now, when we do Python, we'll see how to do loops in Python. Conceptually, the, the ideas are exactly the same. The syntax is a little different, um, but let's uh, let's write some bash loops. So we're going to see how to write a loop that applies one or more commands separately to each file in a set of files, and then we're going to just kind of step through the loop so that we understand the the syntax of the um, uh, of the loop. Of how the loop works. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at the creatures directory. Okay, so we have these dot dat files in the creatures directory. And let's uh, use the head command to take a look at um, the first five lines of each of these files. So these files have a particular format. They have you know, some metadata, so common name, classification, when it was last touched. But obviously, this date is really weird, 1745. That must be some other calendar. Um, and then some a whole bunch of Cs, As, Gs, and Ts. So these are some kind of like genetic sequence for a particular kind of creature. OK, so let's suppose that what we want to do is actually print out the classification of each of the creatures. So what we want to do is we want to print out uh, for basilisk.dat and unicorn.dat. So not, instead of the first two lines, we actually want to print out just the second line. So if we were to do this on, um, so how might this work? So if we wanted to do it on um, a single file, we could say, okay, well, let's take the first two lines and then pipe that to the tail command and take the last line, 
right? Okay, so that's how that's what we want to run, but we need to run this on every file, right? So if we tried, um, if we do this. Uh, this doesn't work at all. This is, so this is not what we want. So and you can see what happens is that, so because this isn't executing a loop. So if we do this, and then we pipe that, the output to the tail command, we are only going to select this single line here, but we want actually this line and this line. So we need to use a loop. So this is an example of where this pipeline pattern that we've been learning won't work as is and needs, needs some additional work. And we need to use a loop to do that. OK. So now we're going to see how to do this in a loop. So here's the, the basic idea of a loop. So we have some, some keywords. Um, for and in, do and done. So those are keywords. And then we have um, some structure. So we have, or we have some, sorry, we have some variables. So we have thing, which is going to be called our loop variable. And then we have a, a container, like a, a list of things. And that's going to be the, typically it's like the files that we want to process as a list. And we can use wildcard pattern matching to create this list. So we can use like star.dat or star.csv or star.pdb or something to create this list of, of things that we want to process. This variable thing, which is called the loop variable, is the thing that changes values as you go through the loop. So we're going to do some operation on this thing. And then the indentation is, is, um, isn't required, but is encouraged for legibility. And in Python, it is required um, in part to encourage uh, readability of your code. Um, so let's see how we would do this. So we could do, uh, we could write a for loop at the command line. Um, it's a bit involved to manually write a for loop, but we could do so for file name in um, star.dat. And then we hit enter. And now we have, uh, this is the first time we're seeing a multi-line prompt. So here we're going to type do and then hit enter. And then we could put four spaces, one, two, three, four. And now we do the command. So head to uh, file name and note the dollar sign. So the dollar sign is how um, we tell Bash that this variable file name is what we want to refer to. And of course, file name is going to take on different values as we go through the loop. It's going to take on each of the values in the list star dot dot one at a time. And then we're going to pipe that to the tail command and take the last line. And then we type done. And so there's our, there's our answer. Or there's our, uh, the loop executes, returns the results to the, the terminal. So there's your first bash loop. Okay. Now, um, a lot of details explaining about how to how to walk through the different prompts and and the loop, um, but for multi line prompts like the first line is the dollar sign and then every line after that has this uh, greater than symbol as the prompt, and of course then done is what tells Bash that the loop is done and it should go off and execute the execute the commands. Now if we press up. Um, Bash gives us a one line version of the loop. So it has used uh, semicolons to denote the different lines of the loop. Oops. So instead of, instead of writing it across multiple lines, you could add semicolons to just do it all on one line. So if you run that, we get the same answer. Um, so <clears throat> when you're writing code, it's important to use good variable names. So this loop here, 
for x in basilisk.dat, minotaur.dat, unicorn.dat. So this works fine. Um, but instead of using x, file name is a much better choice because you're iterating over file names. And that's more, um, un it's more easily understanding what that loop is doing by, by using good variable names. This is correct in that it will work, but don't do this. It, it's really confusing when you, you as somebody who didn't read this, you're like for temperature in basilisk.dat, minotaur.dat, unicorn.dat, you're, you're like, okay, are these like body temperatures for these animals or like what is going on here? And it just, it just creates confusion. Um, and, you know, research and data analysis is hard enough. You don't need to make it even more, comp more complicated process by using bad variables. Okay. Um, all right, so let's look at these variables and, and loops. So let's go back to our uh, molecules directory. Okay, so we have all these, uh, these PDB files. So let's write a loop where we say four file name in star dot pdb do um, and then let's ls star dot pdb done so what is this done so it has gone through um it has iterated over um the list of pdb files and then run this command every time. And so note that the command never makes use of the file name. So it doesn't do anything different. It just does the same thing over and over. So that's probably not what you want. Um, what you probably want to do would be to, you know, maybe ls the file name. And so this would list out the file name and if the file name wasn't found, it would have thrown an error or raised an error. Okay. So typically you're gonna to wanna to make use of the loop variable at some point during the body of your loop. Because the whole concept of a loop is that you wanna do the same task, but to generate different results on each iteration through the loop. So if you're generating the same result at every iteration from the loop, it typically means you have a bug in your loop somewhere. Okay. Um, so this is just doing pattern matching. So this is going to only list out files that start with the C. Um, so we could do C star and that only lists out Kubane because that's the only one that starts with the C. Um, now this, pattern is different. So this is a pattern is basically like any file name that contains a C. So it doesn't need to start with, with C, it just needs to contain a C. So that's gonna give different, uh, different results. It even picked up the sorted lengths.csv. Okay. Um, so here's an interesting, um, here's an interesting uh, example of a loop that uses redirection of output. So this loop is going to loop over all the PDB files. It's going to echo out, which is going to print. I don't think we talked about the, um, uh, the echo command, but the echo command is like a print statement, it, or it just like repeats the the input to the uh, console. So if you did like uh, echo uh, hello world, it just kind of uh, prints the results of the screen. So this, this loop is going to go through each of the PDB files, print the name of the file name. Then we, we saw that the cat, you know, so if you do a cat on uh, one of the PDB files, it, prints out the PDB file. 
to the screen and it redirects the output. Now, let's look at um, ls star dot pdb. So because we use the single uh, greater than operator, we're going to overwrite this file, alkynes.pdb, at every iteration through the loop. So when that loop is finished, the only thing that will remain will be the contents of protein or propane.pdb. Because we'll go through and we'll we'll write out cubane to the file, and then we'll overwrite it with ethane, and then we'll overwrite it with methane, and overwrite it with octane, overwrite it with pentane. If we wanted to append those together and create one single file, then we would need to use the double greater than operator. Uh, and that's what this one does here. So if you if you actually write these loops out, um, you will see that they do different things. Um, a question, David. Yes. Yes. So, <clears throat> does does the for loop in Bash only work as if it's performing an ls uh, command and looking through the directory, or is it more generic, more general than that? For example, can I give it a let's say an array or list of numbers, and I just wanted to go over these numbers and, for example, you know, rename the files from one to twenty, one to one hundred, whatever. Yes. Does yes. it do more than that? Yeah, yes. So it's, it's quite generic. So the, like in the applications that we're looking at here, the easiest way for us to generate a list iterate over is um, to use pattern matching on files. And it's also a very common application that we have with our, um, our users here at Calst, who typically have large numbers of files that they need to do the same set of analysis to over and over again. Um, so, but it is more generic than that and can be any kind of iterable uh, um, container of things um, can be used in a for loop in bash. Typically, in my own work, I use bash for loops when I have, when I, if I find myself trying to do something fairly advanced, with a bash for loop, I then start thinking about, well, maybe I should do this in Python. And you, and if I need to, to, to touch the file system, there are packages in Python that allow you to do that because the it's a lot easier to write sophisticated for loops in Python than it is in bash. So we'll see some of the examples of that in the Python course in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you very much. But it, but it is quite general, um, it, is, it is very general. Okay, um, I'm getting conscious that we're running out of time. So I want to maybe start jumping around a little bit. Um, okay, so let's come down here and talk about the, um, the, uh, the process flow for a loop, just to make sure that we have um, and we have the, the kind of the right idea. So here's our loop. Um, and it's listed as a shell script, but a, a shell script, as we'll, we'll see briefly when we look at the next, the next episode, basically is just a text file that contains the bash code that you would have written at the command line, basically. So we have our loop, which lo loops over some file names and then echoes out copy file name to original file name. So it doesn't actually do anything. It just echoes out the command that would be run. Um, so let's let's see an example of that. So if we did for uh, file name in star.pdb, because we're in the molecules directory, do uh, echo copy file name and original file name, original. Okay, so what this does, or what this has done is it's echoed out a command that would have been run if we had left out the echo. So this is a good way to, uh, 
to test drive your loops, basically to see that they're doing what you think they are to, that they're going to do before you run them. So you can just echo out the command that you that you will, you think you want to run and make sure that all the variable substitution happens in the way that you think it's going to happen. And so it's like a way to test test your loops. And so here you can just like a, a schematic walkthrough of what's going on. So you start the loop, and um, you know, do you have a new value to process? If yes, then you run the process. The process in this case is echoing out this command. And then once you have exhausted, uh, and then once you run the process, you go back to the start of the loop and you pick up a new value. And once you run out of new values to process because you've gotten to the end of the list, then you hit the no and that takes you down to the end. So that's kind of the way, that's the way all four loops work. Okay, now, Let's take a look at Nell's pipeline. So she has this GooStats program, which lives in, um, so we need to go to the North Pacific Gyre 2012. Okay. So we have this GooStats program and we have all of these um, um, files that we want to process, but we want to process only files that end in A or B, so not these Z files. And then um, there is some other file which is too short. We don't want to process that. But first, let's start like sketching out our loop. So we would have for uh, file name um, in all right, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here. And we're going to use our pattern matching. So now the files start with um, any and e star, um, and then they need to end in uh, a or b, and then they end in uh, dot txt. So those are the files we want to loop over. Do and for the moment, let's just echo out the data file. Echo file, well, file name in this case, because I use a different variable name. OK. So now we're kind of, this is an example of how I would build up a loop one by one. So I know I want to process all these files, so I just run this simple loop to make sure that I'm actually getting all the files that I want, and that my pattern match. This is basically me visually testing that my pattern match is correct. So that looks good. Okay. So now what I might want to do is, well, let's get some space back. So now what I might want to do is, um, for uh, file name in, in uh, any, any I want to echo out the file name and I want to replace it or I want to also echo out the stats dot uh, file name. Now I've already spotted a typo in here, which would raise an error. So I'll go and fix that. Okay. So what this is doing is it's taking, so this is going to be like an input file. And then this is the output file that will be generated by the program. And so far the program has been echo, but the, what we really want to do is apply the, uh, the GooStats program. So now what I'll do is I go through here and replace echo with GooStats. And it says GooStats not found. And ah, that's because I needed to use bash to run goose stats. Okay. 
so now my cursor is just sitting here and it seems like something is happening, uh, but it's not actually 100% clear that something is happening. And because I didn't bother to test how long the Goose Stats program takes to run on a single file, I kind of have no idea whether I'm making any progress or how long I might have to sit here and wait for the results to come back. Okay, so in this case, everything is set up so that the results come back pretty quickly. But the idea is that we kind of didn't do enough testing to, to before we ran this for loop. It would have been better if we, for example, um, well, let's just run an ls. So you can see all these stats files that were generated. Um, so let's go ahead and remove all this, these files that we just created. So any file that matches the stats uh, star txt pattern. So we'll remove those. And now let's look at our, our loop again, except So if we go back to our loop, so we could, we could, we could go back to our loop and we could add an extra line in the loop. And this is where like, now we're getting to the point where like, we really should be jumping to shell scripts because doing this manual editing of the loop on the command line is really tedious and, and error prone. But I could kind of hack in an extra line which says to echo the file name, and then I need to put a semicolon. So now, now when I run this, I'm basically echoing out the file name each iteration through the loop. So at least I know how that I'm making progress. So if this took you know, 20 minutes to run or something for each file, then I would definitely want some indication like this that I'm making progress. And so now we're done. And now we run LS. So we can see we've got all these files in here. So, okay, fine. All well and good. Um, Okay, so there are some exercises here, but I now I want us because we only have about fifteen minutes left, so I want to I want to walk through the shell script idea kind of quickly so that you can at least see it, and I'll leave these kind of exercises on nested loops and all this other stuff uh, for you guys to look over on your own. But we we very quickly went through a for loop. We saw how we used for loops to repeat commands uh, once for everything in a list. Um, we talked about. Um, the loop variable, which is the variable that um, refers to the thing that's currently being operated on. Um, uh, one of the reasons why we avoid spaces, quotes, or wildcard characters and file names is that it creates problems when you um, use wildcards to expand uh, file names. When you want to use wildcards to expand file names, and create a list of files to process. If you use spaces, quotes, or wildcard characters, then that's going to create problems and make it difficult for you to do. So, just use simple uh, numbers, letters, underscores, and dashes, and dots. Um, a good reason to have some structure in the naming of your data files is so that you can use pattern matching to make it easy to select them for looping, like what we did here. If each of these, these, these files here, these input files, if they were named idiosyncratically in a way that wasn't um, useful for matching patterns, then it would have been hard to write these for loops. Okay, so now let's just jump to shell scripts. Okay, um, and what I wanna do is just show you, um, um, an example of a shell script. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to <clears throat> we are going to. So here's our um, 
here's our shell script. First, let's um, remove all of the stats files again. Okay. And so let's look at our uh, shell script. And what happens if we echo out uh, the shell script? Um, I think we need to put quotes around it. Okay, so if we echo this, and we're just going to redirect it to a file which we'll call um, analysis.sh. Okay, so now if we look at this analysis.sh, it now contains the bash code for our for loop. Now, um, what we could do is use the bash program to run this for loop. So we did all this like work at the command line to build up this for loop that solved our problem. And then I, I kind of use this trick echo with quotes and then some shell uh, output redirection to take that command, which I know works, and pipe it to a file or send it to a file. And now I can use bash to run this file. And now it seems to be working, so that's good. Um, I'm going to remove the stats again because. Uh, that appeared to not work. Why did it not work? Ah, um, <laughs> so it did not work. So we only generated this single stats file and look at what the echo command um, echoed out. So, Where was the, uh, yeah, so this echo command here, but here it is when I ran it at the command line. So it replaced the file name variable with the last value that it had had previously when I ran it. So it looks like we need to do a bit more uh, surgery on the script. All right, so let's, use nano to analog to fix this script. Okay, so what we're gonna do is now that we're in a text editor, we're gonna put this on multiple lines first off. And But here, so here's the mistake. So we want this to be a file name and this to be a file name and this to be a file name. Now we can save this. So we can either do control X to exit and then just hit Y for save and enter to save it. Um, now, if we do bash, um, oops, bash analysis.shell. Now this should do what we want. So now it seems to be ticking through all the different files. So this is a great, so great question, Sarah. So if we've already done all the work already, what's the point of saving it in a shell file to run it again, but to run it in bash? So there are two, two answers to that question. So the, 
The first one is that now that we've put it in a script, we have it saved permanently somewhere where we can come back and rerun this analysis by simply running bash and run the shell script again. It'll completely rerun the analysis. So we've made our analysis more reproducible. We don't have to come back and manually type out the, the script at the command line again. So that's one answer. The other answer is that when I'm prototyping a loop at the command line, I would often not be doing the prototyping using like all the data files. Like if I have 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 files to process, I would probably write a loop that would process maybe two files at the command line. So I would just be kind of prototyping only using two files to make sure that the loop goes through two files and does what I think it's going to do. And then I would take that prototype loop and I would put it in a shell script and let it, let it rip on all the files. And then I have basically a repeatable script that processes all my, all my files for me. But the, there's nothing, I mean, the thing about that I, I wanted to show you about the shell scripts is that the scripts themselves, you know, it's just a, a file that contains the, the text that you could have written at the command line. But typing out multi-line commands in the terminal is very tedious and very error prone. So you, you very quickly realize that putting them into bash scripts is, is the way to go. Um, so this shell scripts episode just has some more examples of that. Um, it has some sim simpler shell scripts and then um, eventually builds up to some more uh, so like here's the actual example that we that we just did. Um, so one of the one of the things that you can do actually. So I'll, maybe I'll end uh, end with this. So here we hard coded the list of files to process in the script. So one of the things that we could do is if we go back and we look at the script again, instead of hard coding the list of files to process, we could do the following. Um, there is a special variable, uh, dollar sign at, um, and we can protect ourselves against possible white space file names by putting double quotes around it. So um, this dollar sign at is a special variable which says basically process whatever goes in, whatever gets passed in as an argument to the shell script. So what I mean by that is. So let's save this. So now we can, let me, let me just remove all the, uh, the stats files again. So now we can use the bash program to run our analysis, but now we need to pass in the files that we want to analyze. So what we can do is we can say um, do star and either A or B. So now we've made this script more general. So by, by lifting the hard-coded value of the files we want to process out and passing it in as what's called a command line argument to the bash script, We've made it so that now this analysis script could be applied to any combination of, of, of files that we might want to process. So maybe we go back and collect more data, we get a whole bunch of other files, and maybe some of these files don't necessarily match that pattern. So we would have a different pattern of files we'd want to process. So we just made it more reproducible, basically. Or more, sorry, more generic, not more reproducible. Um, Okay, so there's a lot of more exercises here. Um, I would encourage you to, you know, as you have, have time to maybe come back and revisit some of these exercises. The, the computing environment is always available. The lecture notes are always available. Um, but I think we are out of time for today. So are there any more questions or any questions uh, that I could quickly answer? Yeah, uh, David, 
Yes. So when we when we write a, a shell script, okay, uh, how different is the shell script from the typical commands like bash ls rm? Why do I need to write bash file name dot sh rather than just calling analysis? Right. Because typically okay. that's how the Windows command line works when you have sure. you know, okay. a batch file. Uh, okay. So that's a good question. So um, it's something that I, I don't think that this is actually uh, in the lecture notes. At least I didn't see it as I was I was glancing through. But what you need there are two there are two things that you need to do um, in order to uh, um, in order to just run the script. So the first is that so as it is, our analysis script. Um, needs to uh, needs to say what program should be used. So uh, we start over. So in order to avoid doing this, and then some input files, you need to modify the shell script itself to tell shell what program to use to run the script. So the way that you do that is you modify the first line of the script. So there's a, a pound symbol, which is for comments. And then you provide a pound symbol exclamation point, and then the path to the program that should be used to execute the script, in this case, bash. So you will often find shell scripts that have this first line, and it seems cryptic, but it, this is what it does pound exclamation point slash bin batch. So what this does is it says, use the executable that is that exists at the absolute path slash bin slash bash to execute this script. Yep, so you add that, one, that first line. And even that is not quite enough because now you need to make, um, So notice how these um, these programs, GooStats and GooDiff, are green. And actually, over here, so if we and if you use the dash f option, they've got these ex, uh, asterisks or stars after them. So that means that these are executable files. And so these programs you can actually run from the, you could actually run from the command line. Um, and notice that they have these executable permissions over here. So they have this, this X. So the reason that we didn't talk about this is that I have to talk about two things. So one is adding the executable inside the script itself and also permissions. So we have to make the script executable, which we can do by changing, this is change mod um, executable permissions to the script. And now our script is executable. And if I remove the, the stats files again, now I should be able to just run the shell script. Ah. <laughs> But I need to actually pass in the input, the, the pattern that should be matched on the input files. There we go. So if you got a little bit lost there, no worries. Both of those topics, I think, are actually covered in the more, more advanced set of shell lecture notes uh, called shell extras, the link to which um, I will give you now in chat, and then I will make sure that I put it on the uh, and the extra information in the YouTube channel. So I'm just gonna uh, copy that address. And so here's the link to the next set of more, what's well, not the next, it's to the more advanced
the more advanced set of lectures. And this covers, if I'm not mistaken, um, so working remotely, so how to use shell, how to access um, via SSH and SCP remote servers um, and permissions, which is something that I just talked about and shell variables and some other stuff that um, are interesting but more advanced topics beyond the scope of what we were talking about today. So um, typically with my own bash scripts, I do what I just showed you here. So I will make the first line of my bash script will have that. And then I will make the script executable so that I can then just run the script at the command line like this. Or you could just write bash and then do it like we were doing before. Okay, it's so clear. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, well, if not, then thank you very much for spending a Tuesday afternoon with me. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to register for the, uh, the follow on courses. So next week is going to be, um, Conda. So we're going to walk through how to use Conda, which is a tool for managing, um, your application and software stacks, uh, particularly for Python, but not just for Python. Um, but it's basically a, a way to build consistent reproducible software stacks for your various data analysis projects. And it's a critical component that you need to understand before you can get into actually writing uh, your Python scripts. Because if you want to write a Python script, you have to know how to manage what version of Python you want, what version of all the data analysis uh, packages that you want. And you need a tool to do that because it's a bit complicated. So I'm going to teach you how to do that next week. Then after that, we're going to dig into Python, Git, and SQL, which are kind of the three of the core tools for doing uh, data science. So if you haven't had a chance to register, please uh, register for those follow-on courses. I think there's still some uh, space available and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you next week. Uh, there's a question, is it possible to talk about GCP and ML? So in the follow-on course, so in the spring, there's going to be a set of more advanced workshops. So I'm going to teach a sequence of courses on scikit-learn for machine learning and PyTorch for deep learning. And um, those courses are going to use uh, GPUs, uh, at least for the, um, the PyTorch portions of them, not for the scikit-learn portions. And some of them will run, if you're internally, some of them will be more focused on um, running on our cluster Ibex, which has uh, GPUs. But the ones who are joining us from outside CALS, they'll run on um, Google Colab, which runs on Google Cloud's platform. I'm not going to dive into like the specifics of like Google Cloud platform and all of its machine learning stack. Um, but if you want to dip your toe into that, you will be using the Google Colab, which will have some GPUs for you to do your, uh, your training. But that's in the spring and the registration for that is not yet available, won't be available probably until around January. But you need to know all this stuff before, uh, before you can come and take advantage of the, the material in the spring. Cause I'm going to assume that you know Bash, Conda, Python, um, and I'm going to use Git and GitHub repos to share all the code. So it'll be helpful if you know a little bit about Git and GitHub too. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. And I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. So the link to the recording will go around probably tomorrow. Um, so you can, you know, go through this workshop as much as you want.